souls to Jesus and to call people to repentance. Our topic tonight is, I died for an hour and 45 minutes. This guy has been speaking all across the globe for some eight years, speaks all over all kinds of places, all kinds of churches, and so much. And by the way, if you want to know if this is real, the Bible says that you'll know them by their fruits. Fruits is last year, 2013, he was able to lead 10,500 people to the Lord with this testimony. That's how you know it's real. Help me welcome Dean Braxton. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Pleasure, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Stan, it's great to be here in uh, Texas. You know, um, as I've been telling some of your, your people here that uh, I've got lots of family in this area. And I was originally born in Houston, Texas. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we're titling this uh, message or this testimony, In Heaven Experiencing the Throne of God. Um, I really tell people a lot of times, it's really Jesus' testimony. You know, I, I'm the one that gets to benefit from it in the sense of him doing it to me. But any testimony is really God doing it. And we just get a chance to go around and tell people how great our God is. That's what a testimony is all about. And I get to go around and tell people about what happened to me about uh, eight years ago. Um, my heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. That's 105 minutes, you know, if you want to look at it from that point of view. And I died. And I went where I always tell people Christians go. Christians go to heaven. It is not unusual for Christians to die and go to heaven. That's what happens to us. I'm born again, know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of me. Now, these are not just my words. This is um, from the doctors that worked on me, and this is also in the medical records and transcripts. So I'm not just telling you something just to be telling you something. We do have the um, actual documents that say that my heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. We have the doctors that said I was really, really dead. And that's a really great medical term that he uses there. <laughs> and I didn't know that you could be really, really dead. I thought you just dead. That's it, you know what I mean? But I think for him, because of who he is and what he tried to do, that was the best way of him describing what took place, is that um, I was really, really dead. Now, he's not just done this in the sense of telling me. It's also been in several interviews that he's done um, that have gone nationally. So it's, this is out there. You know, I always tell people it's easy for me to prove that I died. That's the easy part. Where I went, that's a whole different issue. You know, there's a couple of things I want to say before I get going any further. And they are this. If you believe me or not, it's not the issue. The question is, are you going to heaven when you die? That is the major question for me, you know. Um, many of the things I'm going to tell you are not what we call salvation um, answers. And what that means like that, if you don't believe it, doesn't matter. You can still go if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you know. That's who gets you in. The other thing that I want you to understand is that um, I'm not up here to entertain you, you know. Uh, when I got to heaven, Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. I know who gets you in, Amen. you know what I mean. I came to understand that no one on this planet gets you in. Jesus gets you in. Yeah, right. But the reality of it is this, you guys. Jesus is the only one that gets you in, and you don't have to entertain people either. You know, a lot of times we try to prove to everybody that we're born again or we're Christians, and the reality of it, the only one that really knows is Jesus. Is that good news? Amen. You know, um, the other thing that you, you need to know is I'm on my way home. This is the journey or the pathway that God has said I need to go to get there. It isn't uh, a requirement if I don't do it, I won't enter, enter into heaven. But I want to fulfill his purpose for me on this planet with everything I have. And today, for whatever reason, he's saying this is the pathway I need to go. And you're the ones I need to go past. But I'm on my way home. I am not here to build a kingdom. I'm here to only enhance his kingdom only. You know, what I want to start off with is that um, my wife is not here. She's um, with my daughter um, in Virginia. We have two grandchildren there. 
Anyone that's a grandparent knows how much joy that is to be with your grandchildren. And she's enjoying them. Um, but she is a major part of this story. She is really the one I call the general, the one that led the charge to pray me back to this planet. We had an understanding that if one of us leave, the other one wouldn't um, pray the other one back because we were born again. But the reality of it is she reneged on her promise. OK. What happened is uh, in 2006, May 5th, I went into the hospital for a kidney stone, for a little bitty kidney stone. But I also had what we called a kidney infection. Um, me and my wife were planning that evening really to fly out here to Dallas. Our son at that time was going to Christ for the Nations and we were coming out to get him and bring him back. But I went into the hospital with this kidney stone thinking that they'll take care of it. We had changed our uh, date to fly out for Monday and um, I didn't go in there to die. I just went in there to get this kidney stone taken care of and then I was going to get out. I knew that uh, the next day they were going to go ahead and do the operation. They were going to blast the stone. I figured I'd be out that afternoon and on a plane in two days. Um, but that didn't happen. What happened was that I had a kidney infection. And they had given me antibiotics to kill that kidney infection. But they never went back to check to make sure it was gone. So when they blasted the stone, they pushed the poison or the infection into my bloodstream. And I became what they call sepsis, which is one of the leading causes of death in the United States right now. You know. And that poison traveled through my body. And as it was traveling through my body, everything in my body was shutting down. Um, I always tell people that uh, it wasn't my heart that stopped first. It was my lungs. I suffocated. That's what really took place. And then my lungs and then my heart went on, said, I ain't getting no air. So I'm a, you, I ain't going to work either, you know. And for an hour and 45 minutes, they worked on me to try to get me coming back. You know, the doctor that uh, was in the room when it took place. It's Dr. Manuel Irege. He's a um, really a highly claimed doctor in our area. He was voted as one of the 10 best doctors in the state of Washington. And he's voted as the best doctor for patient care in the state of Washington. So it wasn't just anybody that was really at my side at that moment when this took place. He wasn't the doctor that caused the problem. He was the doctor that was called in to clean up the problem. He was a critical, critical care doctor. And his job was to stop me from dying, okay? He um, said that when he got in there, that um, his norm is only 30 minutes of working on a person, and then, then he quits. And that's the norm for most doctors is 30 minutes. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of wish he would have quit at 30 minutes, okay? Because I was not in a bad place. Going to heaven is not a bad thing. You know, some people, oh, you're so lucky you went to heaven and came back. I tell people all the time, I did not go on a scouting expedition. <laughs> I was planning on staying, you know, when I got there. Everything is right. There's nothing wrong. So Dr. Rigge, for whatever reason, went past his 30 minutes and went past another 30 minutes and went past another 30 minutes and then 15 minutes. You know, when you ask him, he said, I really don't know. I believe it's because of the prayers that my wife and others were praying for me. You know, I call her the general because my wife is a prayer. She's an interceder and she was praying for her husband, not only to come back into this body, but to be totally healed. After I came back, they still didn't expect me to make it. And I stayed in the ICU for a number of days. They had me on life support. The breathing machine was doing all the breathing for me. They had me on a kidney machine because my kidneys had stopped. They, f they said that 29 different things were wrong with this body. And that means that uh, they weren't working, you know. Um, the medical records literally point them out. I could go through the list here and say some of the things. But some of the things I can't pronounce because I'm not a medical doctor. Other things, I don't know what I'm really saying. But when I show the records to any medical person, they always say, if you didn't die of that, you should have died of that. And if you didn't die of that, you should have died of that. There were so many things that was wrong with this body, you know. Uh, literally, I tell people all the time, according to science and the medical records, I should not be standing here before you. I should not be standing here before you because anytime you lose oxygen to your brain for five to ten minutes, you usually have brain damage. And most of us know that. 
Now, I'm glad my wife ain't here because she would say I have brain damage. But, you know, but I don't have any brain damage. And what she bases that on is because I don't take out the garbage when I should sometimes. I told her there was no garbage in heaven. And so um, I got out of the habit. Okay. But the bottom line is this, you guys. She stood in there and she prayed. And God literally not only brought me back and put me in his body, but healed all 29 different things. And I have what I call no residue at all. You know, the only thing that says... You can go ahead and clap. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's your God. You know, that's him. That's what he does. The only thing that says I went through what I went through is the medical records and the doctors. That's the only thing that says I went through it. I died for an hour and, and 45 minutes. It's called clinical death. That's what took place. Okay. It's not brain dead. It's not uh, biologically being dead. Those are the other two uh, areas that we talk about when a person dies. I was clinically dead. What that means is my heart and my lungs were not operating at that time. I was not getting any circulation going through my body, nor was I getting any air in my body. And most people don't realize what that really means. It's then your body starts dying. And after usually 17 minutes, you, move, you start to move into what we call biologically being dead. Cells are dying all over your body because they don't have the oxygen. There's several things in the records that said that's what the process was for me. It was happening at that time. I had another doctor that looked at the records, a Dr. Reggie Anderson. He wrote a book called Appointments uh, with, with Heaven. And he's a doctor that's been there with a lot of people that have died. And he said that um, not only did I have a massive heart attack, but it was 10 times greater than the numbers that mostly would happen on a massive heart attack. And yet I stand before you totally heal you guys. And you can check it out, you know. And I don't have to make up a story for God. I don't have to exaggerate. That's how great our God is, period. As they were wheeling me down the hallway after they did the operation, I realized that I was losing breath. I couldn't catch my breath. And all of a sudden, I knew I was dying. You've got to understand, at that moment, I did not come into the hospital to die. I came in for a little, simple kidney stone operation. And all of a sudden, they're wheeling me down the hallway, and, and I couldn't catch my breath, and I came to realize I was dying. I was not getting enough air into my body. It was becoming less and less and less as time was going on. All of a sudden, I realized that I was not scared. I was not freaked out. I was not hysterical. What rose up inside of me was these words, I'm going home. And I was looking forward to it, you know. <laughs> to begin, God is great. And he placed inside of me already, when that moment would come, I would know it, and I would know I was going home, and the peace and the comfort that would come upon me would be something I could not explain to anybody. When they finally got everything taken care of, about 16 days later, I remember them taking the tube out of my mouth because I was on life support. And as they took the tube out of my mouth, the first words that I said was, you know there is a Jesus. You know there is a Jesus. You don't have to hope there's a Jesus. You don't have to wish there's a Jesus. There's a Jesus. And the person that was there taking the tube out, I told him to go and tell his wife. I told him to go tell his friends. I told him to go tell everybody there is a Jesus. My mother and my dad and my brother walked into the room. Because they had called them because they didn't think I was going to make it. You know how they call your loved ones in. As they walked in the room, I told them the same thing. There is a Jesus, you know. There's a scripture I love to read. And it's John, the 14th chapter, 1 through 6. And I'm reading it out of King James Version. This is what Jesus says. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go as ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are goeth. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to, unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes unto the Father but by me. Usually when I'm giving this testimony, I always start off with that scripture because that scripture literally captures everything that I experienced. What was it like to go to heaven? I can remember when I realized I was dying and the next moment I realized I was gone. I was moving fast, faster than the sound, faster than light. I went from the room through the hospital, through the atmosphere, through what I call near space and into outer space. And I was moving fast. It was not I was lingering around waiting for anybody. You know, I wasn't waiting for no one to take me. I knew exactly where I was going. And that's what the scriptures say. We know the way. From out of space into darkness. It was so dark. There was no light in this darkness, but light moving through it. I knew I was going home. I could see the lights ahead, the light ahead of me. It was like a window. Literally like a window in a dark room and there was light on the outside and I was on the dark side. But I was headed toward that window with everything I could go go with. I all of a sudden noticed that there were these other lights that were passing me by. I knew they were the prayers of people praying. They were people that were praying for me and others. There were millions and millions upon millions of them shooting past me. I even like to say they looked like shooting stars, not because they were, but that's because the tails of them were passing me so fast and they were beautiful. And I say beautiful, I mean beautiful. <laughs> I can't even really describe how beautiful it was to see these prayers go past me. They were passing me by like I was standing still, you know, and how fast was I moving faster than the speed of sound? faster than the speed of light. I was moving fast. And yet the prayers that people were praying for me and others were passing me by. I knew it was from people from this earth. I knew it was from people that had a pure heart for God. And yet I knew where the prayers were going. They were going to the heart of God. I can remember as they were passing me by that I could even know that who was praying for me. I was in my river of prayers. You know, I have to even stop when I think about it because it was so beautiful to know that many people cared for me. You know, and later on, my wife said she got on the phone and called everybody she knew that would, could pray to pray. And my son even told uh, Christ for the Nations when he was going there to have that school pray for me. And my daughter was going to a school up in Chicago at the time for college, and they were praying for me. And as I was leaving this planet, going there, it seemed like I was riding in on the, my own pr the prayers that people were praying for me. It was so beautiful. When they came past me, as I said, I knew that they were prayers, but they were, as, they were an eternal substance. They weren't just something that was just like poof and they're not going to be there any longer. There was some type of eternal substance to these prayers that were passing me by. The pra prayers kept on coming past me until I entered into heaven. I did not notice them anymore as I entered into the atmosphere of heaven. It's not that they weren't being coming. It's just that I took my focus off the prayers. I was in heaven. As I came through the darkness into the light, the first thing I experienced was this. Everything is right. There is nothing wrong. It is past peace. It is beyond peace. There is absolutely nothing to be peaceful from. Not a thing. Everything is right and I was free. I had pure joy. I was I, I could I could experience the love that was around me from everything that was around me. Everything in heaven was glad I was there. <laughs> Most people don't realize that everything in heaven is alive. There's nothing dead. Everything is alive. I was alive. I was more alive than ever. Some people said that you were dead. And I said, no, I never died. My body did. But me, the real me, never did die. 
I can remember I had no more remembrance of death. And there was singing and music coming from everywhere. It wasn't real loud, and yet it wasn't quiet. It was just beautiful. I heard a beat, like a drum beat, and yet it was pulling everything together. It wasn't pushing things away. I knew instantly that heaven is big. I knew I was connected to everything in heaven. I looked at some of the things in heaven, and instead of just seeing them, I, all, I started to experience them. I knew God had connected everyone and everything in heaven of his, correct, his creation together. I knew heaven, and I was experiencing it. I knew I was in pure joy. Everything there is alive. And I was really, really glad. <laughs> Everything welcomed me in. It's hard for me to even go past that because Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for you. And I really believe at that moment he tells everything there, you are coming. I knew I was home and welcome. I was smiling really, really big. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to even smile bigger than what I could. Everything in heaven was smiling back. I experienced the smiles. There's everything in heaven is alive and can cum communicate. There's angels, atmosphere, ground, plants, animals, like, like buildings. Everything is alive and could communicate to me. There is only life in heaven. Just life. All of the life in heaven is intelligent. And I knew God was still creating life. I was using my thoughts to their maximum. Every thought I had was complete. Angels. I saw so many angels in heaven. I experienced them. They're more beautiful than we can ever imagine, and they were eternal. I noticed there were so many angels that did not look like men or women. I saw angels that looked like everything that you could think of that's created on this planet and more. So many animals, so many other earthly creations that look like heaven or look like angels are in heaven. I saw angels that look like light, fire, Water, clouds, wind, tree, flowers, mountains, human, and much, much more. I saw big angels and small angels. I kept looking at them, and I just saw the beauty of every one of them and what they were made of. I knew that there was no gender of angels in heaven. They may look like a male or a female, but they were not. I saw colors. I saw color and I saw colors. <laughs> there were colors that I have no name for here on this earth. I never saw colors like that before. I could not imagine even the colors that I saw. The colors were so bright, brighter than anything I've ever seen. And colors were alive and moving in the atmosphere. The atmosphere was a goldish white. The atmosphere was bright, but did not hurt my eyes. The atmosphere was like a curtain or curtains blowing in the wind. The atmosphere was like a white waterfall, but the water was going up. The atmosphere is alive. I knew that Jesus and the Father light up everything. There is no darkness there. I knew that I knew I live always. Everything, everyone and everything was alive and always will be. I was not old and yet I was not young. 
I was being. I was being whom I was created to be. I was being whom I was in Jesus. I was being whom I was in the Father. I was being the being without time. I knew I was made to be the being in the moment that I was there. Time did not exist. I was far from things, but at the same time, in an instance, I was near. When I wanted to be somewhere, I would think it and I was there. I can remember thinking it seemed like where I wanted to be would come to me, but I knew I was the one moving to it. But at the same time, it was moving toward me. The only words Jesus spoke to me audibly was, it's not your time, go back. Everything else, he just looked at me and downloaded what he wanted me to know. All of God's creation communicated that way. Since everything is alive, everything could communicate with you. And everything communicated through, through thought to thought. It seemed like talking was a waste of energy. When I did communicate with other creations of God, I could understand every thought in their thinking. I knew I had to ask permission to enter in someone else's thinking or thoughts. When I heard anyone open their mouth, they were singing. They were singing in their own language. In every moment, and in every moment, it was a new song. There was no waste, there was no wasted sound. I should title this next area, which I say no waste, as everything is right. It was only when I got back here that I realized that there was no waste in heaven. Waste does not exist in heaven. Everything in heaven has a place and a purpose, and there is nothing out of place. Everything in heaven, it was right. Life is right. Communication is right. Relationship is right. Purpose is right. Moments are right. Movements is right. Space is right. Connections is right. God was right. Jesus was right. The Holy Spirit was right. And I was right. Everything was right according to God's rightness. Everything had a purpose and everything was fulfilling the purpose God had created it for. We, talking about myself when I was there, was fulfilling our purpose to the unlimited possibilities. I saw Jesus, the Savior. As I moved into heaven, what was before me was a forest of all kinds of trees. The colors of trees were so beautiful, more colors than I could describe. And I knew the trees were alive and could communicate. I knew I had to go through the trees, the forest. As I got closer to the trees, they started to depart before me. A path came up before me and I started moving through the trees. I was not walking on the ground. I was moving just above the ground, like floating, but it wasn't floating. But I had all the control of where I was going. What was I walking on was hard, but it was above the ground. I knew at that moment that no matter what I do or how high I would go, there would be a hard substance up there. I was in control of my movements and how high I went. And there was also grass and flowers moving out of my way. I heard life in heaven saying, he is going to see the king. He is going to see the king. He's going to see the king. All the, all the way through, I could hear them saying, he is going to see the king. Near the end of the path, the trees made the final opening. The, the path disappeared, and I was out of the forest. And I saw my Savior. I saw my Lord. I saw my king. He was standing in a grass field or above the field. He was standing in the midst of a half circle of creation and the children of God, communicating with them. Everything around him was soaking in his glory. This is what I knew 
I was made to be in his presence. I knew that it was, I was in my place. As I came out of the forest, I saw how bright Jesus is. He has a body like a human body, head, legs, feet, arms, hands, eyes, ears, nose, everything human he has. He just doesn't have reproduction organs. He was so bright and I could look right through the brightness and see him. The brightness of the colors, white was greater than anything I have ever seen. The brightness after a bit was mixed with so many colors, red, blue, green, yellow, orange, and so on and so on. The colors left him and they wrapped themselves around me. The colors was before me, around me, coming out of me. The brightness was before me, around me, coming out of me. I knew the colors were alive. I knew my saber was before me, around me, and coming out of me. I looked at him from a pure heart of love, and I experienced his heart. I knew that because of what he did to make me right with him, I could look at him and see him as he is. I experienced a pure joy in looking at Jesus. I saw what he looked like and know what it, it cost him for me to be there with him. I experienced the love he has for me like I was the only one he loved. I was bowing to one side of Jesus and I looked at his feet. His feet looked like the colors of fine brass or polished bronze. His feet had the same brightness as, the, as brass and polished bronze around them. I knew it was his glory coming off his feet. I saw the nail prints in his feet, but they didn't matter. They did not matter. But I stopped looking at the brightness and all I could experience was the love that was coming from his feet. Love for me. His feet loved me. It is like his feet only loved me. I knew he loved others, but it seemed like he only loved me through his feet. His feet loved me. I started looking at other parts of his body and every part of, your, part of the body I looked at loved me like I was the only one he loved. I looked at his hands. I saw the wounds from where the nail pierced his hands. I looked through the wounds and again I could see the love in his hands for me. His hands loved me. I hope you guys are getting it. You know. I knew he loved others, but it seemed like he only loved me through his hands. As I reached his face, it was so wonderful. It reminded me of liquid crystal. It seemed like every time I looked at his face, it changed. It looked a little different, not like it did before, just a little different. I saw where the colors were coming off of him. The colors were coming from his face, like a rainbow of colors. And more colors came off and out of his face. The colors were alive and they came from his feet. I mean, from his face in waves. I looked into his eyes. The colors, are, his, the colors of his eyes are like fiery red, blue, orange, yellow, green, and so on and so on. I saw in his eyes that they were deep and full of life. I got lost in his eyes. I never wanted to come out. His eyes loved me. I knew that I, he loved others, but it seemed like he only loved me through his eyes. I thought about my wife, and in the instance, I saw the love he has for her, like she was the only one he loved. I thought about my children, and in the instance, I saw the love he has for them, like they're the only one he loved. I thought about my mom, and in the instance, I saw the love for her, 
like, he, like she was the only one he loved. I thought about my dad, and in an instance, I saw the love for him, like he was the only one he loved. Anyone I thought about, the love he had for them would come up like they were the only one he loved. In his eyes, I saw the love for every human and creation of God. I saw in his eyes that he wanted everyone there. He did not want to lose one person or have them go to hell. I knew at that moment that he wanted everyone with him there. He wanted everyone there because he had created a great kingdom for them. I looked at his head and I saw his hair. His hair loved me. I knew that he loved others, but it seemed like he only loved me through his hair. What was on his hair was a crown or what looked like a crown. The crown reminded me of the sun, like someone had taken the sun and just put it on top of his head and they had rays going out and they went up and out and it was really bright. The rays had something to do with healing. Rays, they, after they left, they did not end. They just went up and up and out. His hair was white as snow and was wrapped around the rays. I was down on my knees before his feet. Jesus turned, looked at me, and saw himself in me, and I was in. I then said to him, you did this for me? Thank you, 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 thank you. I could have said it for the next 3,000 years or longer. My first thank you was because Jesus looked at me as if I never sinned in my entire existence. He had forgiven me. It was like I had never sin my whole life. I had no remembrance of the sinning at all, and Jesus could not remind me, for he had forgiven me and forgot. I knew that I knew that I knew, and I know Jesus forgives and forgets. Everything within me praised him. Everything I was made of yelled out and praised to Jesus. No one had to tell me to do it. I knew what to do. It was like if I would have stopped with my mouth, my hand would have kept on doing it. And if I would have stopped with my hand, my feet would have kept on doing it. Everything that I was made of or existed of at that moment was praising him. I lived off the praise. No one, no one, no one in heaven received praise but the Father and Jesus. No one. I knew that the Holy Spirit was in the, on the inside of me, helping me to praise the Father and Jesus. The Holy Spirit was still with me. He didn't jump out and say, I got to go get somebody else. He was still with me. And I praised him. It seemed like I was turning into God's love. It seemed like all of heaven was just made for me. I knew I was in my place. I was in my place. I knew I had the right to be there in heaven because of what he had done for me. I knew what he had done for me because of what he had done for me. I knew I, needed, I was, had the right to be in his presence. I knew no one could hurt me. The reason I said you did this for me is because I knew what he did on the cross 
was for me. I knew that I knew. The only reason I was there is because of what he had done for me. And I knew it. I knew I was perfect and complete before him because of what he had done. I knew none of my works got me, none of my works got me in there. <laughs> Came to understand all the good works that have ever been done through me was him doing it through me. He gets the credit. My works don't get me anything. And I knew I was there only because of what he had done. I knew I had been set free and nothing could keep me from being with the Father and Jesus. I knew I could never be separated from my Father and Jesus again. As I received in my heart that Jesus really wanted all humans on earth and heaven with him, I looked up to Jesus and said, even child molesters. He said to me, when you place a person in jail, they get out. They die or are released, but they get out. But when we put a person in hell, they are there for eternity. When he said this to me, he was looking down at the ground. Then he lifted his head and looked at me and said, who are you to nullify what I have done? Then I experienced him hanging on the cross. All at once, he was saying to me, you did not pay the price for them, I did. I knew at that moment that he truly wanted us there with him, all people. I knew from that moment, only Jesus is the gatekeeper to eternal life. I knew that Jesus knows the truth about all people's hearts. I came to know how valuable people are to him. Jesus looked at me and said, it is not your time. Go back. I went above the forest to go back. I started going back. I got to the edge of heaven to where the light meets the darkness and my body was not ready. I cannot tell you how or why I knew. I just knew my body was not ready. And I was glad. <laughs> As I said earlier, I did not go to heaven to come back to earth. My goal was to stay. I returned back to Jesus a different way. I went around the forest this time. I went to the left. I didn't go through it. I believe I was staying. So I was going to go see some other things in heaven this time. I was headed back to Jesus because I knew I needed to go back to him. But I believe I was staying. As I moved to the left of the forest, I experienced life in heaven. That's the best way I could say. Everything smiled at me and gave me great joy. People there, flowers there, grass there, trees there, mountains there, water there, animals there, lots of horses running around, lots of horses, and more angels than I could count. Heaven is huge. Moving by just thinking a place, and I was there. Some of the different things of life communicated with me. I would stop moving, and our thoughts would exchange from each other. As they communicated to me and I communicated to them, I experienced what they were communicating. When I returned to Jesus, he was still communicating with the half circle of creation and the children of God. I kneeled before him once again and I started thanking him again for what he had done for me. As I was thanking Jesus, I looked, I looked at the Father on the throne. I seemed close to the throne of God at that moment. I could see very close to everything that was taking place at the throne. 
I experienced the love, the life, and the great light coming from God the Father. All I knew was he was big, large, huge, vast. He's unmeasurable. There's no end to him. You know, I can remember coming back here and people ask me, how big is God? And I would try to grasp him in my thinking. And I thought if I speed up my thinking, that maybe I could grasp and tell people how big he is. And I can remember my head saying, if you keep that up, you're going to have the worst headache you ever had. The brightness of who he is was the glory of who he is. Out of all the glory came, came rainbows of many, many colors coming off of him. And every color was alive. What was he sitting on? A cloud of great glory and joy. I knew at that moment the cloud was his throne. He sits on a cloud. I experienced that he sit on the throne. He is the throne. In front of the throne was something like water. It was like the crystal, but very much alive. It was living. It was living water. It was living creation of God. Now, after this liquid, there was another liquid, and it was like liquid fire. I saw Abraham. He would go down to the liquid fire, pick up some of it, and hold it up to the Father. And the Father would smile at him. I knew it was pure worship from Abraham to God the Father. The throne of God was hovering over this liquid fire. Around the throne was a great many of his creation. Great many of his children were giving him praise. I saw them moving around the throne in the atmosphere was all these beings, or what we call angels. And around the Father, they were saying, great all how holy he is. But they were so small compared to him. I knew right away I was made after his likeness, in his image. Many people always ask me, what does he look like? And it's hard for me to bring him down to our level and say he looks human. We look like him. Again, the joy of experiencing the knowledge of being made in his image rose up in me. Knowing he, he, knowing he, does, not, he does not look human, but that we look like him, which is above looking human. Oh, boy. I was his son. I, I looked like his son. I knew I was redeemed by Jesus for him. I knew I, that I could call him father. I heard us that are redeemed or people there, we would call him father. Everything else there would call him the word. There was Nothing to stop me from experiencing the Father's love. I didn't have my flesh there. It was here on this planet. I was spirit and soul. I didn't have it in the way to give me any um, input in what I should accept and what I shouldn't accept. You know? I didn't have no limitations to me. So I could experience the fullness of the love of God because I didn't have this here given any input. Wow. I looked into his eyes. He looked at me as a son and smiled. I experienced the love of the Father God in pure joy, life, and truth. I knew that everything he created for me was his way of saying, I love you. I knew I was number one with him. I also knew that all of his children were number one with him. <laughs> I experienced how valuable I am to him. I knew how valuable everyone 
was to him. I understood how all of creation approached the Father. No one questioned him. No one doubted him. I remember hearing some of the creation said, he God, and they would move on. Whatever he said, whatever he, he would speak or, or command, no one would come and second guess him. They would just say, he God, and move on. They didn't have to understand everything, and I understood that. They just had to know what he wanted them to know. They would say, he God, and move on. As I was sitting, better yet, as I was kneeling before Jesus, I looked at the throne of God, and I could see the prayers people were praying. They were moving fast and still looking like shooting stars. The atmosphere had millions upon millions of the prayers coming, and I saw them entering into God the Father. I knew at that moment that our prayers were coming into God. I knew that two types of prayers were being prayed. One prayer was this, people that were praying, and they knew the will of God, and they were praying from that point of view. And then there were people that were praying with everything they had, they didn't know a whole lot, but what they knew they were praying from. And what got me there is he was acting like they knew everything. I knew that once they reached him, they entered into him, and he became our prayers, and our prayers became him. I knew he remembered every prayer. Is that? It's hard for me to talk about this and stand here still because I'm experiencing it even as I'm telling you what's going on. I knew he remembered every prayer every prayer I knew our prayers did not have a shelf life these are prayers that are coming from a pure heart and I knew it God is wanting to hear from a pure heart I came to understand at that moment of being in heaven that he is the only God who had the authority to answer prayers. <laughs> this was understood because he is the only God who can hear prayers. <laughs> also, there was this great joy in knowing he is the only one who can do something about prayers anywhere. I knew because he is and he is always will be the answers to our prayers. I knew because he would communicate to Jesus around the prayers. I understood that Jesus became the answer to our prayers. There was a longing that I experienced when I was looking at the Father in that he wanted to hear from his children. There is a special place for everybody's voice that's his children, and he wants to hear from them. Jesus looked at me again, and as he looked at me, he said again, go back. <laughs> you know, it's not your time, go back. He said it this time, more stern. As I was leaving this time, I had a sad sense inside of me. 
I was not crying, but it seemed like I was crying on the inside of my spirit. But I knew I was not crying. I was starting to go back to the edge of heaven. And I knew my body was not ready. This time, when I got to the edge of heaven, I could hear the cries and the screams and the squeals of those yelling in pain from hell. I knew that if I looked over, I would be able to see what was happening to them. But I also knew that it was not his desire that I look, nor was it his desire that they be there. So I did not look. I turned around and headed back to Jesus. And I was glad. I didn't think this there, but I thought it here. And it's the old saying, three strikes and you're out. I was thinking three strikes, I'm in. As I left this time, I had the force before me again, and this time I took the right side. As I was going back along the right side, it was different than when I left on the left side. It was in constant change. Everything was right, and I knew that, but it was in constant change. As life passed me and I passed it, everything smiled at me again and gave me great joy. This time it was different. The water and lakes were different. They were alive and they were moving. And it seemed like they were playing with everything and everything was playing with them. I saw this being shoot straight up into the air. And as I saw this being shoot straight up in the air, I saw the water come out of its banks and rise up. And as it rose up, it made a loop like in the air like this. And this being, which was a redeemed person, someone that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and went on to be with Jesus, was up in the air. It this, this being turned around and was coming back down. And it was headed toward the water. And I can remember the water opened up like it was saying to the being as it went through, ha ha, you miss me. <laughs> Again, everything could communicate with me and I could communicate with everything there. There's nothing but life. Life, you guys. Joy always was there in every communication. When I was about to reach Jesus, I went through the half circle this time and noticed Peter and James there. All at once, I realized Jesus was busy doing something with this half circle. This is what I saw. Jesus was standing to the left of me. Now around him was this half circle of God's creation and redeem. You could call them angels, some of them. He was communicating to this half circle of beings or angels of God redeem. He was standing in the field like grass and dirt. He would look down to the ground and all of a sudden something rose up and it was a city. And he would communicate to the beings that were there in that half circle, they would bow before him and back out and they were gone. He was giving them instructions on to do something on this planet. I remember looking at them as they bowed before him and thought to myself, now that's respect for Jesus. That's the allness of Jesus.
or even as the Bible says, that's the fear of the Lord. I've never seen respect for Jesus like that as being on this planet. And it's probably one of the things that breaks my heart. Mainly because we look at whenever he communicates to us as a suggestion and not a commandment. But anything that comes out of his mouth is a commandment. I knew they were being sent to war to fight in the heavenlies. They were being moved because of the prayers that were coming in to heaven. And they were going out to do the assignments that Jesus Christ had appointed them to do. He was strategizing. And he wasn't strategizing from their point of view. He was strategizing from our point of view. Because after he would send them forward, I experienced him looking on this planet to see who would fulfill their portion of that battle that was getting ready to take place in the heavenlies. From that moment on, I knew that Jesus strategizes about everything that takes place on this planet. It's just not something that just happens. He has put a plan to it. I came to understand that we that are on this planet are part of that plan. Are we going to fulfill our purpose that we're supposed to have? I could see them fighting in the heavenlies, these heavenly beings. And their weapons were nothing like I thought they would be. But the one thing that they would have that was the most powerful was the word of God. And every time they spoke the word of God, the enemy was defeated. And it was twofold because even those on the planet or earth, they would speak the word of God and I would see the enemy being defeated. Hmm. What Jesus told me about our churches on the earth. After I experienced Jesus strategizing, I understood why he had to look down on this planet and try to find someone to fulfill the purpose. I saw the government of God, or what we call the kingdom of God, operating. I saw the information leave from heaven to the local church. I saw him strategizing. And the local church was part of that strategy. I knew how important the church was to Jesus on this planet. I feel like that's something that I need to go into more detail with. And I want to spend more time on that area, but it's because it's important to each and every person here that it belongs to a church. It's no accident that you're part of that local body. Jesus is strategizing. Even the Bible tells us in Acts, when the church was beginning, that God added to the church daily. Many of us think we just pick a church. We don't realize we're added to that body and we're important to that body. I saw the government of God. I saw how the kingdom works and the local church is a part of that government. Jesus looked at me and started telling me that there's two spirits in every church. One is represented by the Philadelphia and the other one is represented by the Laodicea. And he said, that spirit is rampant those spirits are rampant in every church and it's up to the local body of the church which one is going to overtake i came to understand that there are those that are 
committed to the Lord and will give everything they can to make sure that people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then there's those that believe because of their finances that they're okay. And he was saying that literally in our churches, both of those spirits run. Sometimes it's more in one church or another, but sooner or later, one spirit overtakes the other spirit. And why he's strategizing is because he's looking down to see who will operate under the spirit that will give everything they could to get people to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As I was there, he kept on communicating about this area. And he let me know of a time when there was a man that was on the planet. And when I say the planet, I mean Earth. And how that man did a lot of things to destroy a lot of people on this planet. And one day he showed up to that man. And when he showed up to that man, that man said, I did not know I was persecuting you. He then said to me that he sent that man to a place and then he had to strategize. And he had to find another man to go and talk to that man so that man could come to know him as Lord and Savior. And he looked at me and said, that man's name was Saul. And I got it. He's doing that every moment for every person on this planet. He is just looking down to see who will be obedient to do what he has asked. I came to understand that he wanted them there more than we want them to be there. He will do everything he can to get as many people from this planet to be with him forever. He will not do evil, but he will do everything he can short of evil. When he stopped talking to me, all of a sudden it got quiet in heaven. Everything got quiet. Not like quiet around here when we think it's quiet. It was quiet. There was no sound at all. I didn't know what was going on at first. And then I saw this being, this angel, rise up. This being looked like a woman. It wasn't a woman, but it looked like a woman. And it, it rose up off its knees. And as it got to the point of standing, it raised its hands like this. It opened its mouth and music started coming out. I could hear trumpets. I could hear violins. I could hear harps. I could hear all this music coming out of this being's mouth. And it seemed like it had one note and another note on top of that. And then it stopped and it let out some more notes down at the bottom end, like two more. And then it went back and it let out three more up here and three more down here. And now all of a sudden it was four more up here and four more down here. And it went back and forth like that for a time. And the music, you could still hear it as it was coming out of the mouth of this being. As I said, I didn't know what was going on. And then all of a sudden, I experienced it, and I knew what was going on. This being was calling all of heaven to praise. And everything in heaven was stopping and coming to the throne and literally kneeling before the Father. After this being got done singing like it was singing, and it was more beautiful than you can ever imagine. I remember being on this planet thinking to myself, I wish I could grab that music. But nothing here on this planet has yet sounded like what I heard. But as if this being was done, it went down. It got back down to his knees. And all of a sudden, on this side of the throng, on the right side of the throng, this multitude rose up and started singing. And they were singing. They were giving praise to the Father. After they finished, another multitude rose up and they started singing on the left side. And after they were done, all of a sudden, individuals would stand up and start singing to the Father. All of a sudden, I saw more individuals standing up. The music did not clash. 
It did not compete with each other. It wasn't harmony. It was something else, but it was beautiful. All of a sudden, I saw the sea before the throne rise up. And as each being was singing, a note would come out. And I knew that note had substance to it. And the sea would rise up and wrap itself around the notes. And the notes literally would become different sounds. It was like it was playing the notes as it was praising the Lord. I saw the colors coming from the Father. And as they would come, the notes would go back up to the Father. And as the notes were going up, the colors would dance with the notes as they would go back to the Father. Everything is alive. There's nothing dead. Everything is alive. As I saw those beings praising the Lord and the water praising the Lord, all of a sudden in motions like loops and, and streamers just going all around and around, just giving praise to the Father. I saw a group of beings dancing. They were using everything they were created to give praise to the Father. The atmosphere started thundering like because it was giving praise to the Father. As I was watching all of this, I was singing. I was singing. What was coming out of me was sounds too, musical instruments. I was singing to the Lord and I was telling him how much I loved him. I remember looking above the Father and seeing this glory like a cloud. And as I looked at it, all of a sudden it was like the glory was giving glory to God. I don't know how much more I could explain of what was going on, but everything in heaven was looking and giving praise to the Father. And then all of a sudden, the father opened up his mouth and he started singing. When he started singing, you knew it was love. I saw those notes coming from him that were alive and it was nothing that could stop them from reaching the one he was singing to. I can remember the notes coming to me and they were love. And he was telling me how much he loved me, how much I was important to him, how I was his son, and that no one could take me from him. This was the worship that was going on. The father was singing back in the worship. I really believe that there are times when we praise him on this planet, on this earth, and all of a sudden he sings back to us. And that's what we're really experiencing, him singing back to us a love song. This went on for a while. How long, I couldn't tell you, but it went on for a while. All of a sudden it died down. And I was... Looking at Jesus again, I was focusing on him once more. But this time I noticed something. He was standing to the left of me and I was on my hands and knees before him. And on the other side of him was my family. There was my grandmother on my dad's side, or my mom's side rather. The one I really give credit for praying me into the kingdom of God. She was standing there. What did she look like? She was shiny. She had a big smile and she had pure joy. I knew she was shining because Jesus was shining out of her. I knew the joy that she had would surpass anything that I could explain to you right now. 
And I knew the smile was because she had no worries, none at all. She looked at me and she smiled. Behind her were other relatives, other family members that had to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to be there because that's the only way you get there. And I knew some of them, but the majority of them that was there, I never had been with on this planet. It was generation after generation after generation after generation of all those that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they came to greet me in. They were shiny. They had a big smile and pure joy. Anybody that had added to my life in any way for me being on this planet that was a part of my family, they came to greet me in. All I could remember is if I could have got past Jesus, I would have hugged him. <laughs> but I knew it was not right for me to go past him at that moment. There was one person there. And I'm telling you something now as I process it back on this planet, because I didn't process it there. There was one person there that I did not think would be there. That was my dad's sister. I didn't have her there. I had her in hell. I can remember that um, she was in a different type of church than me. They taught about Jesus, but I didn't think they really were a group that was going to go to heaven. But I knew the only way that you get in is through Jesus Christ. So she had to accept Jesus to be able to be there. They taught the gospel, but not like I thought they should be teaching the gospel. And she was there. I can remember thinking to myself, Lord, I thought we had an agreement that if anybody in my family comes to know you as Lord and Savior, you would check with me first. <laughs> I had a checklist and I wanted to make sure everybody was ready to go. So. And yet there she was. I thought to myself, Lord, you went behind my back and got her born again. <laughs> These are all the things I thought about here, because when I was there, I did not think that way. I was glad she was there. She was glad I was there. But I could just remember how I had her in a box in a different place than where she was. And I came to understand as I was processing this back here on this planet it didn't matter if I knew, as long as Jesus knew. You know, he knows the hearts of people. Sometimes we think we know, but we don't know. And she was shiny. She had a big smile and pure joy. I came to understand that Jesus is the only gatekeeper. There is no one else. After a while of experiencing heaven. And when I say experiencing it, you just didn't look at things, you experienced them. It was more uh, past than just looking at someone. If I was to look at this young man right here on this front row, I no longer would just be looking at him, I would be experiencing him. It's past anything you could ever imagine. In those last moments in heaven, my mother, mother, looked at me. And she said these things to me. Bring as many of us back with you as you can. It hit me hard. Family is important to God. Our biological family are those that come into the family by being grafted in by adoption our marriage are important to God. Again, another processing I did when I got back on this planet. Family was created in the first chapters of Genesis. You are created to be with your family forever. I came to understand family is important to God. 
And I just to let you know, don't worry about some of your family members. When they get there, be right, and you'll be right. They'll be okay, you'll be okay. They won't have issues, and you won't have issues. God has, Jesus has literally made a way for us to experience family like God has meant us to experience family. The other thing my grandmother said to me was this. Heaven is your home. Earth, you're just passing through. She wanted me to make sure that that would stick inside of me so that when I left that I knew that I am on my way back home. That I'm just passing through. And this is the journey that the Father has put me on to head in that direction. Jesus looked at me and said for the third time, go back. <laughs> it's not your time. Go back. When he said it this time to me, I'll be honest with you. I felt like I was crying on the inside. I did not want to leave. I can remember the words coming out of his mouth. They were powerful. I remember thinking later on in the hospital room, I should have been blown apart. I can remember thinking as I was in that room, I saw everything move out of the way. Like they were saying, he's not talking to me. I can remember the atmosphere bowing before the words in respect. And as they reached me, I could just remember the comfort I had, like life had just entered in. I felt like a soldier. I felt like I was to say, yes, sir, and salute and head out. I felt like he was saying to me, I need you there more than I need you here. Came to understand that every Christian on this planet, you're here for the same thing. He's saying, I need you here more than he needs you there right now. I left to head back to this earth, to this planet. I had to go through that darkness again. That darkness is thick, thicker than you can ever imagine. I don't think human flesh can go through it. But in that darkness is a bunch of demon devils and evil spirits. Going, they couldn't touch me, and going back, they couldn't touch me. I came to understand how powerless they really are over us. But I heard things as I was going through that darkness. One of the things I heard was this. He only has power. He only has power because they give it to him. And it was two of the demons complaining about Satan and how humans were giving him power because all he is is a deceiver. One of the things that Jesus said when I was there is the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen. Another thing he said is a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. And then he looked at me and said, his kingdom will not stand. I went through that darkness, entered to the hospital. I saw lots of people running around, around my body. I didn't know why they were running around so much, but later on I came to understand they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> they had no idea why I died because no one had given them the medical reports until five days later that showed that I still had an infection in my body. They thought it was some kind of rare disease I had that no one else had. No. I can remember talking to the nurses and talking to the nurses because the doctors did not want to talk to me. <laughs> they, they were afraid, you guys. They were afraid. And in talking to the nurses, even what they have in the medical reports, that what we talk about is really way short than what really took place. It's, it's bad enough, just the medical reports, but the nurses tell us even more that took place there. 
when we tried to get the medical records, they really stalled on getting them to us because they believed that we were out to sue the hospital and the doctors for the mistakes they made. And like I always say, you go to heaven and come back and see how many people you sue. It's not even close to worth it. Here I am coming back to this planet, experiencing the prayers going in the opposite direction. <laughs> I'm laughing about it now, but it was not funny at the moment. They were going that way and I was coming this way. As I get ready to settle into my body, as I'm getting ready to lay back into my body, I think about all the things that I left in coming back to this planet. I settle in. And as I settle in, it was peaceful. My wife tells me for the next few days, they hooked me up, had me on all kinds of medication, and they didn't expect me to make it at all still. They moved me from one hospital to another hospital. When I got to the other hospital, the doctor was mad because he said, why did you bring this guy here to die on my watch? My wife stood in the gap praying for me. And as she stood in the gap to pray for me, three days after I entered into that other hospital, they saw the miracle start to take place. All of a sudden, my kidneys started operating again. All of a sudden, they saw me starting to breathe on my own because I had not been breathing on my own, you guys. All of a sudden, they saw whatever they saw in the blood counts go in the right direction. You know, they could not believe it, the doctors. And I had six of them by that time working on me. <coughs> but as I said earlier, when they finally took that tube out of my mouth, all I could say is, you know, you know there is a Jesus. You don't have to hope about a Jesus. You don't have to wish there's a Jesus. There is a Jesus. Go and tell. Go and tell. There is a Jesus. That's what I want to leave you with. As I'm getting ready to finish here, I want you to go and tell. Go and tell. There is a Jesus. He wants everyone there. He wants your family there. He wants them there more than you do. He wants them there. Awesome talk. Awesome talk, and I, I'm, I'm going to say probably no one in here questions whether he was really in heaven. As a matter of fact, probably a lot of you have been in heaven at least for the last hour and a half or two hours, right? <laughs> Just hearing about it. I'll tell you what, I, I'm encouraged. I look forward to it. But I know time is not yet. I know that we've got to get the word out. The, try me on this, okay? The most important thing we can do in this life, more so than having children, more so than having a job, having a mortgage, having car, more so than more so, is sending more people to heaven. But the first thing we have to do is make certain our name is written in the book of life. Okay, so how do we do it? Maybe it's the DVD. Maybe it's someone in here. I don't know. I don't know whose name's written in the book of life, but I can tell you how to get there. Okay, so... How do we get to heaven? Well, the first thing we have to realize is we can't buy it. We can't earn it. We have to realize we're all a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that before we were born, we were sinners. In other words, <laughs> we were born to die. But Jesus came to 
give us life and life eternal. The next thing we have to do, have to realize we can't buy it, we can't earn it, we can't be good enough for it. Um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so if going to heaven, living forever, having eternal life, if that's a gift, if it's free, if we can't buy it, we can't earn it, then how do we get it? Let me stand in line. Well, here's how you do it. Romans 10, 9 and 10 gives the answer. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now look at this, look at this. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's that saying? It's saying it's not enough to believe that Jesus is the Christ. The devils believe, but he's not their Lord, you see. Not enough to believe it. We've got to believe, we've got to say it. It's not enough to say it, not believe. We've got to believe, we've got to say it. Finally, Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of for Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's repent? Well, <laughs> In my life one day I sat down, raised Christian, fell away, but I decided that I had made a mess of my life and I sat down and I said, Lord, I'll make you a deal. If you'll give me another chance, if you'll forgive my sins, from here on out I'll read your book, I'll follow your book, no more of me running my life. See, there's a lot of people... They want to claim Christ, not because they want to live like Christ. They just want to go to heaven. They want to stay out of hell. You see, but a real Christian is not a prayer. Being a Christian is a way of life. Yeah. Jesus said, be ye holy, for I am holy. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Don't say that you love me and don't keep my commandments, okay? We can't just be a, a, a teeth out Christian. Repent means that we turn around. Repent means that we hand the steering wheel of our heart over to Jesus. Repent means if he says don't steal, we don't steal. If he says don't commit adultery, we don't commit adultery. Right or wrong, right? Okay. Well, why don't you do those things? Oh, because the law is... No, it's not about the law. It's about the Father that sees everything. Okay. So here in just a minute, I'm going to pray a prayer. And it's basically going to say, I am a sinner and I know it. It's going to ask Jesus into your heart, all of the different points, so that when you die, you can go to heaven. But I'm going to guarantee you that it won't do everything. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, shall enter, the, enter, the, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that do it the will of the Father. The prayer is the first step, not the last one. Just because you prayed this prayer didn't mean you get to go to heaven. You've got to pray this prayer, then you've got to continue to walk with Christ. Does that make sense? In other words, you can't say, Oh, Jesus, come into my heart, and then live like the devil and expect to go to heaven. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there of his destruction. We have to trust in him. Amen? Okay, let's pray it. Everyone bow head, close eye, no one looking around. Let's say it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner and I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father, ask Him into my heart, to wash my sins away, to write my name in the book of life, and to keep me holy, and to save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's now, the you... question and answer section. What did Jesus empty himself of when he came to earth? Well, the Bible tells us in Philippians, the second chapter, that he emptied himself of everything that he could have had as being God when he came down to this planet. Now, I'll be honest with you, by experiencing heaven, I know what he left. 
there was no, there was nothing wrong there. Everything was right, okay? And he left all of that to come to this planet to get us so that we could be with him. Okay, the rest of his question is, he was still true God as well as true man. So, so was it just the outward glory he emptied himself of? When, when they say he was true God and true man, you got to remember what Philippians, the second chapter said. He literally put that God part of him aside and became a servant for all on this planet. In the second chapter of Philippians, starting at the fifth verse, you know what I mean? It tells you right then and there. Now, that's from the scriptures. I'm going to say from my point of view, I know what he left. You know, for me, he left no, a place that had no sin to come to a place that had sin. It would be, like, yeah. be like you and me literally taking ourselves, going down to the nearest sewer, diving into the water or into that sewer 33 feet down and coming up a foot every year. Okay, question number two. Why can only people be saved and not angels? Is it because we are made in the image of God and angels are not? <laughs> angels are made there. Angels that are there with the Father have already chosen to be with the Father. When that time came that Satan or, or Lucifer at the moment literally put out that message that you can be like God and those angels there that chose to follow him, okay, they already chose. They knew. It'd be like me to right now to be denying Jesus. I seen him, you guys. It, 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 it wouldn't be like, oh, you think, no, I saw him. I would have to deny Jesus and know what I'm doing, period. Okay, did you get the impression that Darwin is in heaven? He is supposed to have debunked his own theory in evolution on his deathbed or a pilot, and did you give the impression that Pilate is in heaven? Pilate is in heaven and, and, and Darwin, I don't know, in the, in the sense of ask, answering that question, it's not one of those I like answering, to be honest with you. Okay, and the main reason is because when you start trying to tell people who's there and who's not there, then people start trying to get me to be a, like a, you know, say a, a, a soothsayer or something like okay. that. Okay. Okay. Uh, is, I'll ask the question. I guess you've already answered it, though. Is, is Lady Diana in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do people in heaven look back on their life here on earth? Well, number one is they don't look back on their life here on earth, okay? When Jesus literally has cleansed you, he's cleansed you. A lot of times we say, no, you're going to have there, you're going to get there, there's going to be a book that's open, it's going to talk about all the things that you did here on the planet. On that, in that page, on that book, it's going to be one thing, Jesus. He paid the price for everything. <clears throat> when we see people that have died in person or in a dream, are they the people coming back or the person's angel? Well, it wouldn't be their angel because okay. there's no, there's, there wouldn't be their angel. And I know where they're getting that from, but it's hard to answer that question because I need more detail on that. Okay, we'll pass that. There's plenty of questions here. Why do they collect our tears in heaven? <laughs> collect our tears? There were no tears when I was there, okay? So when he said he collect our tears or, or anything like that, it's not tears like we would think. You know, Jesus is, he wants everyone there. There's not a person on this planet he does not want with him in heaven. So I didn't see any tears when I was there at all. Do angels eat food? The word says manna was the food of angels. <laughs> I always tell people this, and I told you this earlier. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can eat if you want. You don't have to. You live off, when I was there, like I was living off the praise. I probably will eat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, remember, you have a different body. That body will be different. You no know? glasses? Yeah, no glasses. <laughs> no aging. So, Is there a judgment for Christians? Word says, for we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus has already taken your judgment. Read in Hebrews. It tells you that he has paid the price for you and has been judged. If you have accepted him as Lord and, as Lord and Savior. You know, Stan talked about being born again. And one of the things that I always say, people, if you are a Christian, you will act like one. Hey, well, I like that. Well said. That, yep. Can I borrow that one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I like it. Have some of the seals, vials, and trumpets already been opened? If so, which ones? No, not when I was there. I agree. Has the accuser of the brethren, Satan, been cast down yet? He's been cast down a long time ago. He, is, he cannot enter back into heaven. 
What about the scripture that says he stands before the Father day and night accusing the brethren? Well, you can stand right now before the Father accusing the brother. That doesn't mean you're there because Father is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's not there. Even in Job, when it talks about he come, presents himself, he's not there. There is nothing sinful in heaven at okay. all. Good nothing answer. wrong. Good answer. Okay. Good answer. Uh, who is going to be on earth, parenthesis, new earth or someone during the millennium reign? Mortals and immortals. In other words, during the millennium reign, who will be on earth? Who will be on earth? Yes. Who will be on earth? Yes. That's one of your questions. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just reading it. You know, I know the answer. I'm just, I'm reading it. From I'm a theological reading. point of view, I can bring it up. But from a heavenly point of view, that wasn't an issue there. No one's thinking about that there. So in the sense of what... Um, what Stan is reading, what do you say, Stan, about that? Uh, I think we will find people that have a glorified body, and then we will find the nations that are allowed to enter into my that's, rest. That's the theology. Okay? Yeah. And then at the end of the thousand years, then uh, <clears throat> the Bible says that they, Satan is loose for a little season. He gathers the people, the nations, Gog and Magog, around the New Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and fire comes down out of the sky and destroys them. In other words... When Jesus blows his glory down on the earth, that's right. He blows that's it what it is. One time at the end of the tribulation, just like Psalm 91 7 says, a thousand shall fall by your side and ten thousand by your right hand, but it will not come nigh thee. For only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. That means we're here. He blows that glory down. As that glory hits us, we get a glorified body. As that glory hits the sinner, they fall to the ground in a pile of ashes and bones. Malachi 4.3 says there'll be ashes under the soles of our feet. <coughs> Other scripture says that uh, in Ezekiel 38, that they'll hire people of continual employment to go out and gather up the bones. And when they find a bone, they put a little stick by it saying, come bury it. So the professional barriers can bury it. So, yeah, there's, uh, in, in other words, if you don't get that glorified body, the first, last, and once and only time Jesus blows that glory down on the earth, you never get it. Those that will be filthy will be filthy still. You know, Those one, that are righteous will be righteous still. One of the things Jesus told me about, and this is uh, confirming what you said, but it's from a heavenly point of view, was that um, he said that God showed up on, Gar on Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> yeah. You know how it says fire and brimstone? It was right. really the glory of God that showed up, and sin cannot uh, exist right. in the glory right. of God, just right. like you just said. But see, what is life to us is that glory hits yeah. us. Yes, that's and right. And we flame on like Johnny Flame, okay? Boom! We get a glorified body from that instant. Uh, it being in the presence, yeah. because see, the sun has gone out by the time Jesus returns. That's the reason these people say, oh, he's coming in 2018. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen, guys. I can give you lots of reasons why. <coughs> anyway, the sun has gone out, and when it goes out, it never, ever, ever relights because Jesus literally, yes. literally yeah. is the light it's of the, the light. world. That's right. Because in him there is no darkness. That's right. And there will be no darkness. You could go up to a cupboard and you could try to open it and see if you could see <laughs> dark. You can't find it because everything glows. Yeah. Everything glows with the glory of God. Yeah. Everything glows. And as that glory hits you, you get a glorified body. That's the reason it says, out of your belly will flow. Come on. That's what it's talking about. That's the final fulfillment of that verse, you see. Okay, here we go. Get me preaching. I know, but that's good. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> we have a church here, by the way. <laughs> Sunday morning. <laughs> How do you think fasting affects our prayers? You know, I couldn't tell you that. All I knew that the prayers that were passing me by were from people that had a pure heart with God. Now, I always tell people, if you want to know if you have a pure heart with God, ask him. He'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> How do prayers get answered? Some and some do not. You know, in the sense of some and some do not, I don't know what they're praying for, but I know that every prayer that reaches the Father, he is looking to answer it. Most of the time what he's waiting for is a heart change somewhere. Does everyone have the Holy Spirit in them? And some people have it activated and some don't. Oh, I think they're trying to say the difference between those people that speak in tongues and those I, people that don't. I know. <laughs> For me, when I got there, I, all I can say is from when I got there, the Holy Spirit was still on the inside of me. So I knew that even when Jesus looked at me, he saw himself on the inside of me. It was also the Holy Spirit that he saw on the inside of me. Were so what, you 
filled with the Spirit before you went? I was filled with, with the Spirit. With evidence of speaking and in with tongues? With evidence of speaking in tongues. <laughs> if you ain't got it, get it. <clears throat> if you don't know about let me, it, let me, ask let about me, it. Can I say something else about that? Sure. Okay, tongues. Remember how I said that everyone was speaking in their own language? It was tongues. Now let me, okay. let me scripturally <laughs> back this up because everybody was praising the Lord and singing in their own language. And it was tongues. When I came back here, I brought that up. People always say in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the 8th verse, tongues will cease. In the Greek, that word really means, or the base word for that word is pause. And it really means takes a different direction. It's no longer a tongue. It's your language. Okay. What is the wheel in the wheel in Ezekiel? Well, I think it's 10. He didn't say it here. Uh, can you describe it more in detail? Did no, you see the Ezekiel I, wheel I did and see wheel? It. I did see it. And ironically, I was telling the guy back there, I would have said it was a helicopter blade. You know, how, you know how a helicopter blade, yeah. and then there's one on the inside? But I don't say that because the Bible says it's a wheel within a wheel. Okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm just letting you know I saw it when I was okay. there. Okay. Can you tell me if these people are there? Adam and Eve, Saul, Lady Diana, Buddha, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I think we already covered that, right? You don't want to cover that. Okay. <laughs> Do Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses believe believers make it to heaven? Ooh. If someone accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, <laughs> they go. When you're in heaven, you don't know who got there through this area. That There's no Baptists there. There's no Catholics there. There's no, and I'll say this, and you got to hear what I'm getting ready to say. There's no Christians there. There are sons and daughters of God. You have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the reason I say there's no Christian, because in some countries, people claim to be Christians. I remember in Uganda, uh, when Idi Amin was um, the um, right, leader, yes. leader, you remember that? And he was killing all of those people. And people were going around saying, I'm a Christian, but they were of the England church or they were of the Catholic church. And I'm not saying those people can't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but most of them hadn't. So in Uganda, they stopped using the word Christian. Do you know what they use? Born again. They wanted to make a distinction because a lot of people were saying they were Christians that were not Christians. They were still doing their voodoo and all that other stuff. Okay, do you have any idea when Jesus will return? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an idea. Okay, uh, when, you, when you come back, do you have any more spiritual gifts than you left with? Oh, no, no. You don't, you don't have any more spiritual gifts. You understand the spiritual gifts that we do have that most people do not use. Do you have any insight into how people get faith? If faith is a gift, how come some people get it and some don't? I don't have any insight. Do you have any insight? Not me. I, this your, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm jumping in here. Okay, see. Uh, how do doctors react to you coming back to life? Oh, you know, they reacted in such a way that in that hospital, and you'll see it on that DVD, they called me the miracle man. They had me even come back to the hospital and make the rounds so everybody could say, you remember this guy was dead? Remember this guy, plus also to give hope to the other patients. But I'm known in the hospital as the miracle man. Do you have a life review? Just reading it. What's a life review? I don't know. Oh, you mean when you leave, do you see your life before oh, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. I didn't when I left. Okay. You know. uh, does God have any shape, form at all? Yes, he has a shape and he has a form. But again, for me to say it's human, to me, is degrading God because we are made in His image. That's, you know, it's hard for me to bring it down this direction. You guys. Are the streets in heaven gold? There are streets that look like gold, but it's more pure than you can ever imagine. Gold, to be honest with you here, because it's in infected by decay. Impurities. Impurities. You don't even... It doesn't even come close. And John, a lot of times, when he's trying to describe things, or even I'm trying to describe things, we use the word L-I-K-E a whole lot. Yeah. And what we're just saying is, this is the closest I can come to describing what is there, but it's even greater than that. Did I understand that everything in heaven was alive, even the buildings? Even the buildings. <clears throat> and that's why I bring up the scripture around uh, Revelations, the uh, 16th chapter, the 7th verse, because you got this table... And all of a sudden, it's, giving, it's getting pr praise to the Father. And that same table has some horns on it, and those horns are giving praise to the Father. So these are things that are, you know. Did you see the Holy Spirit, and what did he look like? You know, I didn't see the Holy Spirit like we would think. We see though, he was on the inside of me, and I experienced him even in a more greater way than I do here. Is heaven a planet? 
No, it's not. It's not a planet. It's not a place out there in the, in the great beyond someplace? No. It's, you guys, heaven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a door here. Okay, you ready for okay, this? Okay, go one? ahead and walk through. It isn't that heaven is in our universe. Our universe is in, our, in heaven. Amen. Heaven is bigger than our okay, universe. Okay, that's a better answer than I'd have come up with. You must have been to heaven. <laughs> <clears throat> what form were you in? Solid body, what did people look like? You know, it's hard to describe what you look like because you're not old nor are you young because you're not aging. There's no time there. Okay. But you still know everybody, you even know though every you might not yeah. recognize their face. No, you recognize them, but they're in the purest form that they could ever be because there's no decay. You will look like this, but not, not the same way, only because you do not decay it. And what does that look like? How do we I measure no that idea. on this planet? You can't <laughs> measure it on this planet. That's why a lot of times I tell people there's no age there. And someone said, what do you mean? Someone asked me, were there babies there? I said, there are people that look like children, but they're complete. And that's the best way I could say it. There's All no right. growing okay. there. There's no time there. Are there such things as aliens? <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I got to answer, everything was focused on this planet. If there are aliens and Jesus died for everything, I always say we are doing a terrible job of getting to the other people. Okay. You know, the, the, now, I just put that out there. You know, you guys can, these are not salvation questions. Jesus is the only one that gets you in. And I always tell people, you don't have to believe these things, but you have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to get in. Okay. Uh, how are animals in heaven without souls? I guess they've been told that animals don't have souls. Well, you know, I used to believe that too. And then animals came in. Um, if you go to Genesis, the sixth chapter, and do a word study there, you're going to find out that when, when um, God told uh, um, uh, Noah to go out and get the animals, you know, two things there. That word that says go out to get things, breath, one is talking about just breath, different, but the second time it, it's the same breath that it's talking about for us when it's saying to go get everything with breath, okay? The other thing is in, in Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, which is probably the best one, when Solomon says literally, you don't know where a man's soul go or spirit goes, whether it goes up or goes down. You don't know where an animal spirit goes, whether it goes up or goes down. And that one just literally says there is a spirit in the animal. Okay. The other thing is that uh, God cares for animals. And all of creation in Romans, the eighth chapter says that they are yearning for the redemption of men or for the completion of men. That means there must be a benefit for them. Okay, and several, and I like to use one scripture, and we use it mainly for money. He owns the cattle on a thousand. Yeah, years. that's right. <laughs> Time to take an offering when you hear that one. Yeah. Oh, what's coming? Okay, we uh, w did you see angels with wings, and will we have wings? You know, I did see angels with wings. I did not see redeem with any wings. Redeem are people that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that are there. Why would we need wings when we could move at the speed of thought anyway, right? Yeah, and, 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 and it's not flying like we think it is. That's why I was trying to explain that literally when I was there, I was above the ground and it was solid and I knew I could go higher and it would be solid. The closest I could come to describing it from a scripture point of view is when Jesus walked on the water. There you go. Uh, can you give personal prophecies? In heaven? Or me I personally? I mean here now, yes. Yeah, I do can. You, you did give. You I do. do. Okay. All right. Uh, where is Jesus? When is Jesus coming back? We heard that. Is there a rapture before the end? Oh boy. <laughs> where are you at on that, Stan? I'm post-trib as they come. I've done a three-hour debate, and I took the post-trib position. Yeah, I'm gonna. So I'm gonna defer I'm, it to him. I'm real post-trib. You know, to be honest with you guys, <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Because I've been there, that is not an issue for me. Oh, my, but my but issue, it'll send a lot of people to hell. My issue is getting people to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm just letting you know. He handled that right, didn't he? Yep. <laughs> Can you tell me what is going to happen to America in the next 10 years? Oh, boy. That is a good question. Jesus said this to me when I was there. If <clears> my <throat> people who are called by my name would humble themselves, seek my faith, turn from their wicked ways. And when he says wicked ways, he's not talking about people that are just American citizens. He's talking about those that claim to be Christians. Okay. Then he said, I will heal their land. Okay. And the reason I put that out there is because he was saying, when he sees that happening, things will change here. 
And I know people say, well, I'm praying. Stan, when you have a prayer group here, how many people show up? Three, four, five. That's what I'm saying. In America, we talk a lot about prayer, but in reality, we do not yeah. do a lot of prayer. <clears throat> the other sure. thing I saw when I was there with the Father and Jesus, I was looking up on this planet, and you would see where Jesus was sending the angels, and it was where the most prayer was coming from. That makes sense. More prayer, and in America, out of 10, 1 to 10, I would say it was a 4. Did Jesus tell you why we have to come to earth? That's the question. No, he didn't. All right, maybe I'll turn it around here. Did Jesus tell you why you had to come back to earth? He said I, he needs me here more than he needs me there, you know. Okay, does color have a specific color within our spiritual gifts? That's a good question. You mean on this planet? No, I'm thinking it, they're, they're referring to this in heaven. Uh, in other words, <clears throat> is, can you tell that people were of different races there? And does that affect their spiritual gifts? No sounds like the question. Yeah, no one thinks that way there. So you're not looking at a person of being white or black or this color or that color. You're all children of God, so that's how you think, you know? That wasn't the question. What was the question? Color and gender. Like you could see all the colors. Yeah. Oh, in other words, like prophets, would they be blue or would the only thing evangelists that, be green? Or The only thing I saw any link with color was with families. There was always a tie between a color and a family. What does that mean? Well, I don't know what blue would mean, but I know that families are given gifts. Individuals are given gifts, but most people don't realize a family is given a gift. And most a lot of, the time, of gifts. <laughs> yeah. Heaven is a gift, right? Yeah. Free gift. Is la oh, well, I guess that's... Uh, here, wait, no, here we go. Do okay. pets go to heaven or animals that are in heaven created there and have souls? I already answered that. Pets were coming in. Someone will ask me, how do I... How, what was the requirements? Jesus didn't <clears throat> tell me. It was out of my belief system. I didn't believe it before I left. I was hoping no one ever asked me that question when I got back. All right, that's it. Let's give him my appreciation. Thank you for coming, brother. Good evening. Am I on? You are on. All right. You can't hear me? Yes. Now you can? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start off really just by... Um, all right. Sticking to the to the book this time around. Okay. Um, but I, I did really want to ask you a question because obviously on that uh, that video there was a lot of detail missing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everybody's really interested in the details. Um, so uh, the the first question I got uh, for you is: Can you share with us like just every detail that you can remember? <laughs> You know, I, I, as you were, as you were like, you know, dying and leaving your body, and is it, was there more detail than we see up there? Or there? Yeah, there is more detail in the sense of, you mean what it was like to really leave your body? What what you experienced? I mean, the whole death thing, and then you know, making that trip. Well, you know, some of the things this this show here, um, the people weren't people that really um, had a Christian background. Okay. And so some of the things I was saying was hard for them to grasp. So they did the best they could to put it in the framework for them to be able to understand. Um, but can when I, I was... I, can I clarify something? Before yes. Before go past that? Because I think in our conversation, you, you have said to me, and it's not that it's... Uh, I, when we use the label Christian, it, it might even be something that... That would you say is spiritual? It's spiritual because it's spiritual versus yes, this, yes. this planet. Yes, yes. And you're talking to them about things you experienced. Yes. In the spiritual realm, yes. that you can't describe. Is that fair to say? There's some things I can't describe because there's no there's no reference here. I do the best I can in trying to bring it into our senses. You know how we have five senses, uh, James. And I tell people I can literally do maybe two and a half. 
And the reason I say two and a half is I can tell you what I heard, I can tell you what I saw, but I used the word like, L-I-K-E, because that's the eternal realm and I'm bringing it into a temporal realm, you know? And everything here is really dying or falling apart. Even this right here, this little stand right here is deteriorating. If we left it here long enough, someone comes back, it would be deteriorated because it just is. There, nothing is falling apart. Nothing is deteriorating. So I can give you that. That's why I say like a whole bunch of times. And then I, I say, this is what I experienced. If you had some type of experience with God in an intense way, you can go back to that and say, oh, I understand. But I can't tell you how it smelled, and I can't tell you how it tasted. Because there's no taste here. And the smell, someone says, well, it doesn't smell like flowers. Most of us don't realize this, but we're filtering out death all the time. Things are, are falling apart around us. There is no death there. So you don't have to filter out death. It is pure life. So that's the best I can, can, can do in the sense to take up an eternal realm or a spiritual realm and bring it into a temporal setting. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of understands that when he does his best to try to explain things, that's part of the challenge for anybody who... It's like, I, I guess if you lived in Russia and you spoke Russian and lived in a Russian culture and then you come back here and you don't speak Russian. Yes. And try to, and we speak English and have a different culture. Like, how do you communicate it? Well, you do the best that you can. You know, one of the terms I use, and you've heard it before, and some of the people that have heard me say, just go. <laughs> Bottom line. And it, uh, it's not just go so you prove that I'm right. Because I always tell people when you get there, You'll see things, and you'll come up to me if I'm there, and you'll say, Dean, you were way short in really describing this place. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the bottom line is, just go. That's the bottom line. I'm sorry to take you up on that rabbit trail, but so you're going to share with us every detail you can remember <laughs> as you were leaving your body and well, the whole experience that you had. As James had explained to you earlier, one of the things that I really... Um, had an agreement with God it, when I first came back. I was in my bed, laying there, and I said, Lord, I do not want to misuse this. I don't want to use it, and some of you know this term because you, you read your Bible. I said, I don't want to use it for filthy lucre. That's what I said, you know what I mean? Because I, I knew this was something that God wanted me to be able to express to people in such a way that it's not something that people, how you want to say, um, uh, feel like, oh, he's just doing it so that he can get more resources on this planet. You go to heaven and see what this planet has for you. I'm d I just put it out there. There's nothing on this planet compares to the experience of being with the Father and Jesus in that, in that environment. Nothing at all. So I, 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 you know, was talking to the Lord, and there's two things that came up. One was that any time my wife is with me, that she can speak before me and she can take as much time as she wants. Okay. Now, I've been places where they gave me an hour to speak and my wife got up and used 45 minutes of it. <laughs> but to be honest with you, when I start talking about the things, most of the time, wherever I'm at, they extend my time, if you know what I'm talking about. I honor people's time. They say 15 minutes, I'm going to speak 15 minutes. But most of the time they say, can you keep on going? Can you keep on going? Can you keep on going? Because they want to hear it. The other thing was that I would not talk about anything unless a question has been asked. And as he called it, in, after it's been asked, it's in public domain. Then I can talk about it. But if it's never come up, back there, Mary, Mary, raise your hand. I was sitting by her, and she asked me a question. And I looked at her, and I said, that's the first time I've heard that question in six years. So she opened up an area that now I could start communicating, okay, to people. But I just wanted to say that because that's what I've, I've um, I put as requirements, or God has helped put the requirements around me. Someone said, why did you do that? You know, we want to know all this. And I figure this, you just go, you see any old way. I don't have to tell you everything. If you go, you'll find out. Is that good news? You know, it's that simple. It really is that simple, you know? So I don't have to, I always tell people, I don't give out knowledge to give out knowledge. I give out knowledge to enhance people to be the best witness they can for God on this planet. And that's why I give out knowledge. But just if you give out knowledge to say that I know this and you don't know that, I'm not there. Knowledge doesn't get you in. Jesus does. Amen. And I know someone said, ah, that sounds narrow. I didn't come up with the rules. <laughs> Seriously, you guys. I can tell you when I got there, Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. He didn't ask for a resume. 
He didn't ask if I knew Pastor Nichols over here that's the pastor of this church. He didn't say, what about James? He just looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. That simple. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to really put that out before I go into this area. Well, the, the people in the bio channel are the ones that asked me. They said, tell us the detailed moments of when you were leaving your body, what it was like. Okay. And I said to them, okay, this is what happened. When I knew I was dying, I, I heard this voice, and it was like a small voice way over in the corner, and it was saying, you should be panicky. You should be hysterical. You should be freaked out. Do they use that word freaked out here in New York? <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. You know what I mean? So you understand what freaked out means. And it was a small voice. And really what it was, was this flesh. Your flesh does not go to heaven. It does have a voice. Some of you say, I don't understand that. Well, it's the one that has you do things sometimes you don't want to do. You on a diet. You know you shouldn't be picking up that food. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And your flesh saying, hey, we need that right now. You know? Well, my flesh literally knew it was not going. And I should be panicky. But my spirit, the real me, that which lives forever, that you heard me say, you never die if you're a spiritual man. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you're born again, you never die. I came to understand at that moment, that which was inside of me, the real me, rose up and said, I'm going home. I told him that. Now, you saw, what, 13 minutes of three people, and yet I can tell you right now, they interviewed me for three hours. So they cut out a whole lot. All right. And, but, I want, uh, but I wanted to say that to you because at that moment, my spirit left my body. We think the body dies and the spirit leaves. No, the spirit leaves and the body dies. Did you hear what I just said? You can live without your body, but your body can't live without your spirit. So that's what happened to me. So I left and then my body died. And I went to be where the Father and Jesus is. Someone said, why did you go to heaven? Because Jesus Christ, and I'll say this, I'm not trying to preach to anybody, I'm just telling you this. Jesus Christ said that he went to prepare a place for me. And since I was born again, knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, have that Holy Spirit residing on the inside of me, I went where Jesus says Christians go. Did you just hear what I just said? Someone said, well, you were lucky to go. You were blessed. I was blessed to go. But Jesus says this is what happens to Christians. It is not unusual for Christians to go to heaven. That is what happens to Christians. Amen. Now just put that out there. I always think when I put that out there, because there's other people that have these experiences, and they want to build us up like we're something special because we got to go to heaven. That's what happens to Christians. You guys hear what I just said? And someone said, well, you keep on talking about Christians. That I'm putting it in that term so that people in this room will know I got there, Jesus looked at me, he saw himself on the inside of me. The saddest thing, and most people don't think it's sad, but I think it's sad, everybody's going to find out sooner or later. Whether you believe on this planet or not, you're going to find out the only way to get in is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And, I, and I didn't come up with the rule, I didn't say this is how it had to be, I'm telling you what I experienced. And someone said, well that's just your experience. Well, when you have yours, you'll find out. <laughs> I pray that you know now on this planet, to be honest with you, because there is too late. And well, you don't know that. Well, you'll find out. Do you guys hear what I just said? And I did die. You saw the doctor of it. You know what's so amazing about that? And, and James knows this because I've talked to him about it. I have not seen that doctor since this happened. What you're seeing up there is the vinyl channel, the biography channel, went and interviewed him, got his testimony, got me and my wife's testimony, almost two months apart. And you see how they correlate together? Because I think even Pastor Nicholas can bear witness to it. I came out here and I said, there were two times Jesus told me to go back. I didn't know about the physical response on the other side. When I saw the show, that's the first time I knew that literally they had a physical response that correlate with what I've been saying for five and a half years. Wow. 
So you're seeing the same thing that I saw for the first time, and I still haven't talked to that doctor. We have never coordinated our testimony to try to come up with a story. So that, so I died. I died, you guys. I left this body for about an hour and 45 minutes, according to the doctors and according to the medical records. Now, where did I go? Bottom line, I'm telling you where I went. And you may say, I don't believe you. And all I got to say, you will find out. You can't get away from death. Everybody leaves their body sooner or later. Does that answer your question? I, 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 so. <laughs> I, I notice in the book, though, the way that you start the book off, right from the very beginning, the first pages, in the first chapter, you describe how you went into heaven, yeah. then you began to return, and then you got as far as what you call the edge of heaven. Yes. Uh, twice. Yes. Um, why did you begin the book in that way? I, I wanted to start the book off with people having that experience, first of all, of me entering in and being there, and then to be honest with you to say, okay, how did he get there? You know, how did he get into this predicament? How did his body stop operating? You know, those type of things. Uh, because I wanted people to kind of like go, go, okay, go there, come back, go there, come back. That's the main reason that I started the book off that way. I wanted them to have what I call that experience of like, go, like they did. They did a good job, I think, of saying how when I entered in and how things moved out of the way. You know what was the greatest things, and, and I get to really emphasize it more? Heaven was happy that I was there. It wasn't just God was happy I was there, but all of heaven was happy that I was there. We don't think that way. Everything there was glad that I had made it. Is that good news? No? So I wanted people to have that type of experience from the beginning. So obviously if you delineate this thing called the edge of heaven, you know, when you were traveling, there must have been uh, differentiation. Yes, there was. Heaven, heavens, uh, and, and so what did you see that made you see the, the difference and uh, how you know that you were at the edge of something that was different than where you were headed? And, well, and what when I left this body, I left, went through the hospital quick, okay? I went through our solar system and everything you can imagine quick. And then there was this darkness. Um, the best way I got to describe it is what the Bible calls the outer darkness, and there's no light in it. That's really where I saw these shooting stars lights going past me, okay? And I tell people, those shooting stars were prayers. Not only prayers for me, but for other people. They were passing me by. I always try to tell people, this is how quick I got there. I don't have a measurement. It was faster than the speed of light. It was faster than the speed of sound, okay? The quickest I could do it is go to a Bible reference that says, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the, of the Lord. And yet, the prayers that people were praying for me and others were passing me by. Your prayers don't last, don't take long to get to heaven. Most of us think it takes a long time, you know. And they're heart prayers. Most people think they're word prayers. Really, God is listening to your heart. That's what he's listening to. Okay. You can say the words from your, your mouth. I'm not discounting that. But if your heart is not lining up with your mouth, they're not going anywhere. You understand what I'm saying? That's why little kids, they don't have to say a whole lot. You, you know, you remember? I, I like the way little kids pray. They'll pray for something like, mama get healed or daddy get healed. And what do they go do right after that? They don't spend a long time trying to convince God that they need, they need to answer that prayer. They pray it, and then they go play. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm talking about, you know? So those things were passing me by, and after I got out of that, Dark area is like a window. One moment you're in that dark area, that's why people say, I saw the tunnel, I saw the light. It's really not light coming in, but you have that window that you're heading toward, and when you go through it, you're right into the light. And it is light, you guys. So when he was telling me to come back, I went to the edge of that, getting ready to come back through, and that's when I knew my body wasn't ready. Okay, for whatever reason, I knew it wasn't ready. As you could tell up there, they could tip, you know, that's the first time, you guys, that it's correlated with my, what I'm saying about my body not ready and the medical piece saying this is what was going on on this side. So you're seeing that for the first time. And so when I knew my body wasn't ready, I went back. Now, I didn't go directly back to Jesus the second time. 
I figured I was staying, so I traveled around a little bit. <laughs> I ended up back at Jesus, you know what I mean? And then James again, he said, no, it's not your time, go back, okay? I, I say in the book, as you know, um, I say this, I said, I cried on the inside. Did I really cry? No. That's the best way I could explain what was going on on the inside. And then he sent me back and I went to the edge of heaven one more time. My body wasn't ready again. As you saw, the doctors verifying that they had this physical side doing something. And then I decided, again, I'm thinking, three strikes and you're out, three strikes, you're in. That's what I was thinking. Seriously, you know. I believe I am staying this time that I am not leaving. And one of you might be saying out there, oh, didn't you love your wife and your, and, and your children? I said, yes, I loved them more than you could ever imagine. I did not have any flesh, no desires of myself to impede me from really having pure love for anything. You guys know what I'm talking about there, okay? I didn't have no agenda but God's agenda, and that was the love. So I loved them, but I was thinking, no, you come here. You come here. You know, it's like when you go somewhere and you enjoy it so much, you want your family there, okay? And the, one of the reasons is, and I don't know if someone will ask this question, is because you'll never ever be separated from them ever again. There is no death there. There is no memorial services. There's no funerals. There's nothing. You will be with your family that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior forever. I know, I always hear this voice say, but you don't know my family. <laughs> I do not want to be with them forever. <laughs> but the bottom line is this, you guys. Everything is right. They're right. All of those things that are negative, they don't go with you. You don't think that way anymore. You know? So you get along with them, they get along with you. And then the third time, Jesus said, no, it's not your time. When he spoke it, it was like power just came out of him. Everything moved out of the way. It came toward me. I remember laying in the hospital room later on thinking, I should have been blown apart. That's how much power. But I remember it coming in like comfort. Just coming in, it came in. And all of a sudden, I felt like I used to be in the military, the Air Force. I knew what it was like to take orders. And I felt like a soldier saying, yes, sir. You know what I mean? And then, and then I just remember when he said, no, it's not your time. Go back this time. He was saying to me, I need you there more than I need you here. And I came to understand, if you're born again, know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's what he's saying to you also. He needs you here. You will be there. Well, then you're really going to have to clarify, because obviously that's the qualification. You know, we hear that term, born again, but what does that really mean from a, a heavenly perspective? I mean, when it, What it means from a heavenly perspective, uh, perspective is that you turn to right standing with God. That's what it really means. You're moved back into the what I call the original state of how God wanted a relationship to be between us and Him. And how do you how do you get there? You tell them how to get there. <laughs> Wait a second, I have a question. <laughs> I, I'm going to be the one who has to stay behind. You know, you're going to leave. <laughs> it's, obviously, it's not, it's not that. It's good news, obviously. Yes, but, it is. You know, because that, that term gets thrown around a lot. There's a lot of people here who may come from different kind of religious backgrounds. There's, uh, where they, they may be at different places in their spiritual journeys. And, you know, for them, you know, I don't, I don't want them to think that this is just like this. Uh, it's just like a Christian meeting. We came in. We tricked you so that you hear that, oh, you have to believe in Jesus so you can go to heaven. You have to be born again. Um... But to define that in a way that if somebody is not, doesn't have any kind of religious background, any kind of scriptural understanding, what that means, so that they understand, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Because if that's the thing, the key that's going to get me into heaven, what, is, what does that really mean? How do you get there? How do I apprehend that? And you still want me to answer that question? I do. <laughs> One I mean, the, I know, but you know, I, I'm not assuming that just because I know that everybody here knows. And Seems one like of the things I do, you guys, this is Dean, Dean, okay. When I was a young man, I came to the point in my life that I wanted to know God better. All right? I was not raised in what we call, quote, unquote, a Christian home. 
you know. I went to church on Easter Sunday, and it was just me and I had three brothers that went with me. My dad and my mom never attended church with us when we were little kids. Did not happen, okay. But I wanted to have a connection with God. I knew there was a God. I didn't understand God. I did not want to have a connection with Jesus Christ. Do you guys hear what I just said? I wanted to have a connection with God because he was the top. That Jesus Christ was somewhere in the middle and I didn't want him. Seriously, this is how I grew up. And one day someone gave me a Bible, okay? And I always wanted to read the Bible and I tried to read it a thousand times, but I started in Genesis. So by the time you get to numbers, you're kind of like, this is what it's like dying and want this, you know? You know what I'm saying, huh? But this time they gave me the New Testament only. And in the New Testament, there was a scripture that came up that said, take my yoke on you and learn of me. And I said to myself, God, we can learn of you. That's what I said. And I said, if this is true, I want it. It was that simple for me. You know, someone said, well, didn't someone lead you in a sinner prayer and say that you got to do this, this, and this? I, I'll say, no, they didn't. I came to the point where I knew I needed God, and he didn't ask for all the quote-unquote, what does that say, two minutes? All right. <laughs> but he didn't ask for all the, the, the quotes and all that stuff. He wanted my heart. And I gave him my heart, and he gave me that which I was seeking. And that is a relationship with him. Amen. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> now I can put it into the Christian terms. I can give you all of that. But that's how it happened for me. And you know it worked because when I died, guess where I went? Amen. I went where Christians are supposed to go. All right. Those that are born again. You guys hear me? Yeah. So we know it worked. Did I answer that for you, or you want to say Yeah, no, that's that? it. That's, that's your story. So, and I think that if you asked us, we all have a story like that. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was wondering now if we only have one minute. <laughs> Maybe uh, I don't want to ask you any kind of deep question. Anything else you want to expand on while you the take up uh, in the next 30, 45 seconds? Keep one of the things right? I did say, and I know many people are wondering about family members, and maybe we can get into some family member questions. But one of the things that I really wanted people to understand, that family was established to be together for eternity. Most of us don't realize that. We think it's, you know, the family of God, which is important, don't get me wrong, but your, your DNA family, that which God has placed you in, was literally there, was put there for you to be with for eternity. Well, wait, hold on a second, we're gonna take questions at the end. At the end. So we want to uh, just take a little break now. We want to tell our audience that uh, you're here listening to Dean Braxton, the author of In Heaven, and uh, we'll be returning back in just a moment. I, I just, in regards to your book, um, I mean, I've read a number of uh, near-death, after-death, heaven kind of books. And the one that, thing that, about your book that I notice is really different than any other one is that you have all this, these Bible quotes in your book. Right. So why do you, why do, you do that? Mainly is that for two reasons. Number one, it was hard for me to communicate the experience I had there. And I also wanted to connect with people. And so I said to myself and with my pastor, because I do attend a church, I said, okay, if I can relate it to the Bible, then people can go and read it for themselves, and God can even expound on what I've said, even if I'm coming up way short. That was the main reason for that. They may not agree with me, but if they go there and they read it, God can at least expound on what I just said through his way of wanting to come on to know it, because he knows everybody's language. He knows exactly how they're going to hear him. So that was the main reason for, for doing that, is because I wanted to make sure that people, when they hear me, that um, they could at least uh, um, would hear from him in that sense. See, James, I'm free. I came to understand something. Jesus Christ is the only one that gets you in. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. 
I'm that free. Someone may be up there right now, I don't believe a word you say. Well, that doesn't impede me from going to be where the Father in Jesus is. And I know that. I came to understand I don't have to perform. I'm not up here to, 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 to um, do a show. That doesn't get me in. Jesus does. So as somebody who's gone to heaven, then I, what, what will you say to us in regards to really what the Bible is then? Because a lot of people think, well, it's a good book. It's got a lot of wisdom in it and stuff. But if you've been to heaven, I mean, you came back, you looked at it. So what do you think? One of the things that was really, um, uh, not in so much amazing, but was really, uh, what do you say, exciting for me is to see how much I experienced there that was written in the Word of God or in the Bible. There was so much, and it was outside of my box. And people say, what do you mean by outside your box? We all build boxes for God. You guys know what I'm talking about. And, and we do everything to keep him in that box. Okay, here I go to heaven, and he's blowing my boxes all apart. <laughs> but it was um, really good that when I came back, it may have been outside my box, but it was not outside the Bible. I may have looked at it different than the way that he had meant it. I came to understand that anyone that's born again, that has the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of them, has the ability to not look at it from an earthly point of view, but from a heavenly point of view. Because the Holy Spirit is connected to heaven. And so I came back with that mindset of looking at it now from a heavenly point of view, where I had, you know, one of the... the uh, um, things that I had was a criteria. I had my own criteria on how people could get into heaven. Even though the Bible just says you just need to be born again. I had it on chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. You know what I mean? And it was really for my family. And if my family didn't meet those, those requirements, they weren't getting in. Well, what do I do? I get there, and there's somebody that did not meet the requirements I had for them on this planet. They were they are born again. They knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but I had some requirements. And when I got there, there they are. My Aunt Barbara, as I tell people. <laughs> you know, to this day, sad to say, I would have had her in hell. <laughs> if I did not have had this experience. But there she was in heaven. She was shiny, she had a big smile, and she had pure joy. She had to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because that's the only way you get in, okay? But I came to understand I'm not the gatekeeper. Jesus is. And he's looking at people's hearts. So I came to understand that I'm so free that it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about me. That it does not impede me or stop me from going home. Do you guys hear what I say? You know? And so... That was one of the things that really, you know, I came to understand that my boxes were blown apart. My way of looking at it was blown apart. And I started looking at it from a heavenly point of view and seeing that God has a whole different way of looking at this than some of the ways we look at it. But did you come to some understanding of if there is another place you, know, that you, you don't want to go to? Yeah, I came to understand that I just said hell. We'll kind of tip around it, yeah. but there is a place called hell. You know what I mean? That second time when I went to what I call the edge of heaven, I heard the cries from hell. And it was like, I knew I could look over and see it, but it wasn't his desire. It wasn't his desire that they be there, and it wasn't his desire that I look. And I wanted his desire more than mine. That was the, what you, could, you called that, was it the edge of darkness that you talked yeah, about? Yeah, the, ed the edge of heaven, I call it. And again, I, I use that term because I just don't have a better term. Someone else out there may come up to me, people do, and they give me terms, and I use them. People say, why do you do that? Because I'm trying to explain the best I can of what I experienced there. And if someone has a better way of doing it, it's all right with me. And I, I know that you've said that you have come into contact with other people who've had near-death experiences. Yes. And maybe their story sounds a little bit different. Maybe, you know, they didn't see the light and they... What are some of the other things that people have said to you? That well, maybe most of the people, people that had separated, as I call them, and people say, what is separation? They left their body. Their body was dead on this planet, and they no longer had any contact with it. Okay? Most of them, we have a similar experience. 
We may say something a little bit different, but most of our stories are the same. I don't read heavenly books. I don't listen to heavenly stories. And someone said, why don't you do that? Because then if I say something and someone else says something and it matches up, you guys, you got two witnesses right there. Do you hear what I'm saying? The mouths of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Now you have two witnesses. You don't have me literally trying to copy what someone else is saying or someone else trying to copy what I'm saying. So that means you need to pay attention if that, if that happens. So I try to keep it as pure as possible so that if you're listening to someone else or someone else says something, then you can have two witnesses or three witnesses and you say, okay, this is probably true. Do you guys hear what I'm just saying there? And someone said, well, ain't what you're saying true? Yes, it's true. But whether you believe me or not, it's not the issue. You need to go. <laughs> That's what's really important, is that you go. You can say whatever I'm saying right now is a whole lie. I don't really care as long as you go. That's what's important there. So, so I've met other people along the way. I told several stories today to a number of men of the different people that I'm, and they all have great stories. Most people that have this type of experience, they don't like telling nobody because nobody believes them. Most people believe they're crazy. <laughs> you guys know what I mean, huh? They start talking about going somewhere and seeing things and all that, and they go, oh boy, this uh, kind of like tip our way out of here. Well, so they we keep get to the crazy part yet. But they get, they get, they get, they get, uh, uh, so they close up. Here I come, and there's people in this room right now that's had this type of experience. And they will probably come up to me later on and tell me their story because they'll know I'll understand what they're talking about. I guarantee you that right now because it's hard to explain this to people. Now God, for whatever reason, has helped me to be able to put things in a way that most people can understand or at least grab and go with. All right, God can usually do that. Um, but I'm just telling you, that's, that's what's going on. The other thing that's going on, you that are out there that's had this experience, you separated. And I always tell people, well, how are you doing since you separated? Because that person, whoever it is, has to grieve their own death. Did you hear what I just said? They died. And just like you would lose a loved one and grieve that loved one, that person is going through a grieving process because they lost something too. And there is no counselors out there that help that person. I'm just letting you know that right now. The, the, the ones that I really are concerned with are the ones that are children. Because when children have that, then all of a sudden they know they don't die and they are reckless. Do you understand what I mean? They're risk takers. I run into people all the time that they were risk takers their entire life. I ran into a guy that, was, that had been in the army and he was the point man. He loved to be the point man. He loved to be out front. The point man is the one that usually falls, uh, steps on the mind first before anybody else. And he said, Dean, I was never afraid. Why? Because he, he knew he didn't die. And because he had this experience of drowning when he was a little kid. So they're just reckless in that sense, you know? So uh, it's, it's going through that whole process of grieving your own death. So I've come in contact with lots of people that have had this type of experience. Most of the time, we coordinate right back and forth. Sometimes they can say something that helps me to explain something better. Sometimes I say something that helps them to explain something better. That's what usually happens. Okay. Last year, I didn't need these. You didn't need them last I year? I didn't need these last year. I'm getting closer to going home, I guess. <laughs> I'm, I'm, falling, I'm falling apart like this, like this table. All right, we're going to start ans ans answering your questions. Did you recognize people, and how did you know it was them? Oh, that's good. That's a good one. Okay, you did. You do recognize your family. They're, they're okay. I'm going to put it out there because I feel the freedom to do it. Um, there's four groups that come to greet you in when you enter into heaven. Four groups. There's your family. There's your friends. There's your people that you impacted somehow with the gospel or, or about Jesus Christ that come to greet you in, and then there's your pets. That last group, that last group so that you will understand this was not in my box. Okay, that last group was one of those things that blew my box apart, all right? 
But those four groups come to greet you in. You just know. All right? You just know them. Someone says, do you recognize them by sight? You see them by sight, but you see them even more than that. Everything about you literally takes in information, and you just know. You that are, are Christians that read your Bible, there was a time when Jesus came back on this, oh, he didn't come back. He was on this planet, and Moses and Elijah showed up. And the disciples weren't told this is Moses and Elijah. They knew it was Moses and Elijah. And there were no cameras when either one of them were on this planet. No one was painting their pictures. You got to hear what I'm just saying. But these disciples or apostles knew who they were because they just know. Some of you, you just know sometimes. You didn't learn it. No one taught you. You knew it. Okay? And any of you that have children, when your children speak anywhere, you don't have to ask someone, is that my child? You know it's your child. They don't have to be in your presence. You just know it. So when I came into heaven and there my relatives were to greet me in, is that good news, you guys? Yeah. And it was relatives that I knew on this planet and some relatives that I never have come in, in contact with. But they had accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior somewhere in their lives, and there they were. And it was generation after generation after generation after generation they came to greet me in. And someone said, wow, I didn't know that. Well, I didn't really know it either until I got there. But then I came back, and you that read your Bible again, in the first two chapters of Genesis, okay, is when family is established. And if you think about it, it was before the fall. So family was created to be together for eternity. Not marriage. We all know because you said no marriage is there. But family, your DNA family, was literally created to be together for eternity. And remember, you guys, I, I just hear someone yell, you don't know my family. I'm trying to get away from them. <laughs> you're, you're, you're putting me in hell. You just don't know it. You know? No. Everything is right. They are right. You are right. You get along with them, they get along with you. No issues. You guys know what I'm talking about. My wife ain't here, but we're recording it. You husbands know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what about just the way that they looked? Obviously, they could ages. Uh, um, what happens if they were children when they... There, when they there's died, no, or? there's no, no deterioration of them. So they're pure... Uh, in the sense, without any deterioration, I say without any sin effect on their on their on their looks at all, uh, they're more beautiful than you can ever imagine. Um, God did not make a mistake when He created you. Okay, the Bible says you are literally created in His image. Okay, that's what He said. So He's not going to change your image when you get there. You guys hear what I just said? It's just that it's not going to have any ill effects in the sense of deterioration or in the sense of what we say sin. You're just going to be so um, perfect without any of those effects. And you're going to be beautiful. You're just going to be beautiful because God doesn't know how not to create anything that's beautiful. You guys got to grab that. Somebody has self-esteem, they look in that mirror, they don't like it. You're telling God he, he did a lousy job on you. <laughs> And God is perfect. He knows how to do the best job. That's, but in a sense, I can describe all of that. But really what I saw in the sense of what really got me, in the sense of seeing the beings there that were on this planet that went there, um, they were shining. What were they shining for? Because Jesus was literally on the inside of them shining out. All right? That was one of They had pure joy. I can't tell you what pure joy is. Some of you have experienced it because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's times in your life when you have this joy and it's just overwhelming and you don't know even where it's coming. And someone says, describe it, and you can't. It just passed any words. So they had pure joy and they had a big smile. I can tell you what the big smile represented. No worries. They were not worrying about anything. Is that good news? Yeah. I, like, 
I like to say it like, like this, James. You know, here on this planet, we got bills to pay. You know, that was my biggest complaint when I got back here. Why do I got to pay these bills? Really, that was. Because all, it's all paid for up there. You know, you don't have to, I got to, uh, well, I want to get over this party. I got to pay a toll to get over this side of heaven. No, there ain't nothing like that. You know what I mean? And here I come back here and we're paying bills. And I found out the majority of us really, um, what do you say, uh, guide our life around our bill pay. You know, and then if we don't have the resources or the money to pay the bills, what do we do? We worry. And here I am looking at a, a, a whole creation of God that does not know what worrying is. Well, this lady was worried about something, that? I think. You think that answered that question? Yeah, I think so, definitely. Okay. Uh, this lady might be worried, so I'm better off on this side. Right? Do you still have connections with ex-husbands? <laughs> On this side or on that side? I think that side. <laughs> I always tell people, the relationship that you have there is so pure, those things do not play in at all. Okay, you have such a pure relationship, past anything you can ever imagine, you know what I mean, on this planet. In a sense, we will have a relationship there that will be so pure and it will be me and yours relationship. It won't be a relationship I share with somebody else because that relationship I have with them will be me and their relationship. Every relationship will be so unique and so pure that I really don't have the word to describe how pure it will be. Okay. So they don't have to worry about ex-husbands there. They'll have a pure relationship with that person and if they have a husband here and that will be there, they will have a pure relationship with that person. <laughs> that will be, they won't be married. That's so right. they don't have to be. They don't have Most to be concerned. Most people why guys said no marriage. Yeah, no you marriage. Might have more than one. Yeah, but, but he ain't. <laughs> but he ain't looking at that. What he's looking at is relationships that are so pure between you and him, and you and the others around you. They're that individual. Okay. How big is heaven? Oh if wow. You compare it to inside this church, the town. This is what I try to do now because this, this was um, um, really given to me and from a, um, a six-year-old little girl. I was describing to her how huge or how vast heaven was. And she came back and said, oh, you mean. And I thought, well, I'm taking that, oh, you mean, because that, oh, you mean was a good way of describing it. She said, you mean like a grain of sand on, on the beach. The grain of sand represents the earth, the universe, everything we know, plus all of our blackness, all of it contained in the grain of sand. And the beach represents heaven. You see the difference you got? That grain of sand represents all that we think is huge. When they said your universe is huge and it's all this stuff, it is nothing compared to the hugeness of heaven. But I'm, I'm going to ask you a question to, for our scientific people here. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who love physics and quantum physics and stuff. Because, you know, they talk about how the universe is expanding. Yes. And so their impression is that it ex it's expanding out. Yeah. What did you come to understand about the way I, it's expanding? Well, I came to understand, well, the universe, most of the time we look at heaven as being inside of the blackness. We don't understand light was here before darkness. The reason light was here before darkness is because God has been always. That's hard for us to grasp. He is light. That means light was here before darkness. There comes a time, you that read your Bible knows this, there will be a time when there's no more darkness. There will only be light. Okay? So the darkness is not where, it's not heaven inside the darkness, it's the darkness inside of heaven. Some of you are grabbing that. Some of so heaven is expanding outward. Someone said, what is it expanding in? I don't know. It's expanding outward. And it's expanding inward. What do you mean by it's expanding inward? It's coming in this direction. You that read your Bible, there's a day when it says Jesus returns on a white horse. That's when heaven hits this earth. I'm just putting that out there. Somebody said, I don't know if I believe that. 
I said, just believe in Jesus Christ and go. <laughs> he, he, he won't even ask you, did you believe it? He'll just let you in because you're his child. Is that good news? Yes. He doesn't make it hard. He doesn't make it hard. He must want us there. Yeah, he wants us there very much. Which maybe I don't sense this next question, if I'm not sure. What grieves God the most, and what does he want us to know? First of all, he wants you to know how much he loves you. We hear it. Uh, most of us think of it as a blanket love, where like if a cloud enters this room, that um, it covers everybody. I came to understand the day I was created, the day I was placed inside of my mother, was the day that God created love just for me that no one else could receive. It's not blanket love, it's individually tailor-made love for everybody on this planet. She has love that's only made for her. No one else can receive it but her. He has love that's only made for him, that's only, that only he can receive. You can't get someone else's love. God is that much loving you that he's created love, literally love, that only fits you. Amen. That, that's number one that he really wants people to understand. What I think, what grieves him the most is that uh, us, that say we are his children and how we treat each other. I mean, a lot of times we treat each other a lot worse than we treat someone we don't think that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We get offended very easy. And we don't forgive quickly. That really grieves our father. It's just like you with your children. If they're fighting among themselves, doesn't that bother you? And you look at it from your point of view and know that that argument or that fight, most of the time, is not worth the argument or the fight. I remember my two brothers underneath me. I'm the uh, second oldest in my family. And... Um, my two brothers underneath me one day were fighting over a piece of bologna. <laughs> and they were going at it, okay? That bologna hit the floor. And the next thing I hear, it's your bologna. No, it's your bologna. No, it's your bologna. No, it's your bologna. <laughs> See, that's how most of the things that we come in contact with are among us as brothers and sisters. They're not that important. But we get offended, hurt, and then we don't let go and forgive. We have the gift to forgive. It's a gift for us to forgive. Is, uh, is there like a focus in heaven? Are they like, uh, you know, are they like focused on something up in heaven or some particular thing that's important? All of heaven is, is literally focused on getting people in heaven from this planet. And what does that look like? What do you mean? How do, how do you know that? How do I know that? Because when I was there, everything was geared to looking at how do we get people on this planet to know about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so that they can come into that right relationship and be there for eternity. That's what I saw. I, I could say more, but I know our, our time is, is almost, and I want to give for the uh, break we're going to have. Yeah. So when after the break, I'll come back and say more today. Okay. All right, so we're going to uh, take a break now from our session question and answers here with Dean Braxton, the uh, author of In Heaven. What it was that you experienced in heaven and, and how they're, they're focused on the earth. Yes. And maybe how, what you experienced that led you to know that. Well, one of the things I experienced is I was there when people on this planet were making decisions for Jesus Christ. Okay? And I remember literally being on my hands and knees before Jesus Christ and looking at him and hearing this sound coming from this side of heaven. Remember how, he how huge heaven is. That everything that I say, and you see it in the video, everything is alive in heaven and everything is intelligent in heaven. If this little um, stand here was in heaven, it would be alive. God is not making anything dead, okay? You that read your Bible, because you're usually the ones that have the hardest time with this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hate to say it. But in the Bible, in Revelations, the 16th chapter, the uh, seventh verse, there's a verse that says, and the altar spoke. And the altar was giving God praise. And it was talking about something like this, literally speaking and giving praise to God. 
You that don't read your Bible, you say, well, that sounds a little weird to me, too. So, But the bottom line, God is not a God that creates death. He creates life. So what comes off of him is life. Okay? So everything there is alive, and I, even the atmosphere is alive. It has a personality, a attitude, a voice. You that read your Bible again, in Revelation, the 10th chapter, you've got the, where it says the seven thunders spoke. That's atmosphere, okay? And John was told he couldn't say anything that the seven thunders said. You that read your Bible again, the 8th chapter says there was an eagle, a animal, literally flying around proclaiming God. So all of these things there have not only uh, are alive in the sense like we have around here, but they're intelligent and they can speak. Okay? Someone says, I just don't believe that. Again, I say, just go. You'll find out. <laughs> okay? And you won't be up there again saying, Dean Braxton is right. You'll just say, I was way short and really describing it. That's, I'm just putting that out there. So here I am in heaven, and I'm on my hands and knees before the Lord Jesus Christ, and I hear this sound coming from this end of heaven, and it's getting louder and louder. And what it was is somebody on this planet had made a decision for Jesus Christ, okay? They just came into the kingdom of God in the sense of being born again. And when they made that decision, everything in heaven literally turned themselves to the throng or to the Father and started giving him praise and shouting the name of the person that just made the decision. <laughs> you that read your Bible, you've heard the term where it says, the angels in heaven rejoice. And when anybody on this planet makes that decision, it is a rejoicing that it's out of this world. <laughs> literally. It literally is. So in the sense of answering that question, that's why I knew it was important. Yeah. Do we have guardian angels? Yes, we With do. Us. Most of us have more than one. Okay? But we do. The Bible, you that, I always go back to those because the guys, you know, it says that if, if you, there are angels in heaven stand before the Father. Okay, so they tell you that we have angels around us. Most of us have guardian angels. Okay, some of you have experienced that. Some of you haven't experienced that. But you have uh, um, guardian angels. Most of us have more than one. Most of us need more than one. <laughs> Just to let you know that. Uh, they don't have time in heaven. But I bet there would be some tag teaming sometimes on some of us. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, my time's up. I get off in eight hours. This boy's giving me some hard time. I can't wait for the release. <laughs> I got, if you are from another religion, uh, do they have their own heaven or is it the same place? You know, in the sense of, I don't know what they mean by a, another religion. Um, you said Buddhist. Buddhist, Muslim, Jewish. I know this. When you're in heaven, you don't know where they come from. You just know that they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that's why they're there. No one's over here saying, well, I was a Buddhist on, on earth, and I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. No one's here saying, I was a Muslim on earth, and I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. No one's saying, I was this person on earth, and I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You don't have access to that type of information. All you know is they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You guys hear what I just said? Yes. Okay. That's what you know because you can't get in any other way. Someone says, well, there's got to be another way. All I can tell you is Jesus looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. And I knew that was the, that was the, the, the uh, what do you say, the, the um, requirement that he lived on the inside of me. I knew that. He didn't ask me for a resume. He didn't ask me, did I know anybody? He didn't say, well, Dean, uh, there's a holding cell over here, and you need to go there until you get cleaned up, and then you come in. He looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. What did he look like? Um, he's more beautiful than you can ever imagine. It's past anything you can, you, can, you can comprehend in our English language or probably any language. I probably Spanish would do even better describing it. Because I sometimes hear people tell me things in Spanish that I say, and I say, well, that even sounds better than what I say in English. You know? <laughs> you know? 
But the bottom line is that when I saw him, he was brighter than the noonday sun. You know, you guys get sun around here. I ain't seen it lately that much, but you get sun around here. Where I'm from in Seattle, oh boy, that's a whole different story. And have you ever been there? We don't get sun that often, okay? But, um, but he's brighter than the noonday sun, and because you're right with him, because you're in right standing with him, because you're born again and you can look at him, and he's more beautiful than you could ever imagine. Someone said, what color is he? Because people want to know what color is he. Is he. I will tell you this right off the bat. The colors that were coming off of him represented everything you could imagine. You know, sometimes when he appears to people on this planet, and he does do that, he appears in the fashion that they will see him as. Do you guys hear what I just said? Because all of us have these concepts of what he looks like. When I got there, I saw him as he is. No longer did I want to see him as I thought he was. I saw him as he is. I wish I could say to the person, did I answer that question? Because right. Were you able to uh, look back and, and see what was going on maybe with your family if, if they were grieving because they were thinking you're dying? Or is there any kind of way to be able to see back from heaven? I always tell heaven? people, if God wants you to, you can. I always put that in there. You know, uh, We know that, um, uh, that um, literally... Um, the um, man in the Bible, which was the beggar, which was a, what we call Abraham's bosom, could look back and see the rich man down in torment. We know that's possible. So you can if he wants you to. You can look back here, and you won't be saddened. He was, oh, I don't want to see my family go through all that mess. You know what you're thinking? I want my family here. That's what you're thinking. Okay, you, that you know that whatever they're going through on this planet is that much, that much time, that much time. That's everlasting. You know, when I got there, I had no remembrance of anything I ever did wrong. And Jesus looked at me as though I never did anything wrong. When he says he forgives you, he forgives you, and he forgets it. I'm just putting that out there. And some people will bring up Christians sometimes. Well, what about your deeds? He said you're going to look at every deed and measure every deed that you ever did. I came to understand the good deeds that I do, even stand, sitting up here before people, is really Jesus Christ doing it through me. I can't take credit for those. And the bad deeds that I do, I ask him to forgive me, and he forgives them and forget it. So that when it comes to that time of, of that place where people say judgment and he looks at that page, there's only going to be one name on it and it's going to be Jesus Christ and because he paid for everything. <laughs> you that out you know, we are free. We are truly free. Um, is there any way that you can be sure that, you know, that your heart is pure? You can ask him. He'll tell you. And you know, I, I like the way David said you know, cre create in me a clean heart. And when we know Psalms 51, you ask him, he'll tell you. The Bible says this, and again, I just want to use that as a reference. It says this, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. It's his will that your heart be clean. He will hear you. He will hear you. And he will answer you. What was your favorite part of heaven? Jesus. <laughs> See, most people look at it as a landscape or something, which it is. It has all the things you could ever imagine plus. But you're not trying to get to heaven just to be in heaven. You really want to be where Jesus and the Father is. And see, in heaven would not be heaven without Jesus and the Father. <laughs> So people want to say, I want to get, no, you want to be where Jesus and the Father is. Matter of fact, to be honest with everybody in this room, when I first came back, I didn't say I went to heaven. What I said I did, went to is where Jesus and the Father is. It's heaven. Don't get me wrong. But I wasn't counting that I made it into heaven. I was counting that I was where Jesus and the Father is. And someone will say, there isn't there another part of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. And I will say to them, yes, he was on the inside of me. He said he never leave you nor forsake you. You that are born again know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. One of the things you have to come to the realization is God will be with you forever. 
on the inside of you. Some of us say, I want to get closer to God that are born again. I say, well, how much closer can you get? He's on the inside of you. <laughs> Some say, I hope he don't see nothing. Well, I'm telling you right now, he's on the inside of you. <laughs> I don't think he heard that. I'm telling you right now, he's on the inside of you. <laughs> you know, when I got to heaven, the Holy Spirit didn't jump out of me and say, I got to go get somebody else. He stayed with me. Well, I guess this is more of a religious kind of based question, right? Because it says, are there stages of heaven, or do you go directly there? Well, you know, from an earthly point of view, and it says stages, no, you go directly there. Yeah, you have to hear. Catholics, we might believe in pur purgatory, or Jews have that 12 months, you know, they have their relatives praying mm -hmm. for them, you know, try to get them in. I, I haven't been in any Jew Jewish congregations, but I've been in Catholic Catholic congregations before. And they always ask the question, was Mary there? And they always ask about purgatory. And because this is such a documented um, uh, uh, event, you understand what I mean, medically wise, and the hospital really was a Catholic hospital. <laughs> you know what I mean? St. Francis, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, I get to say that when I left this earth to go to be where the Father of Jesus is, I didn't see no purgatory at all. I went directly where the Father and Jesus is. Okay. Someone said, well, maybe if you were the Catholic, maybe you would have went to purgatory. <laughs> you know? But the bottom line is, I, I say to them, when you get there, there's none of that there. There's, there's, there's no longer Catholics there. There's no longer Baptists there. There's no longer, for us that are redeemed and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there's no longer Christians there. Someone says, what are you saying there? I'm saying this, there's sons and daughters only. <laughs> All the titles are gone. So when I left and, and there wasn't no level, she went directly there. I didn't have to go to a, a, a place to get washed up, a car wash, get cleaned up, <laughs> make sure everything was correct before I entered in. Is that good news? That's good news. Can you send signs and messages to your loved ones after you're in heaven? No, that's the first time someone's really asked that type of question in that manner. Okay. I, I can only answer it this way. Um, the Father will get whatever message he wants to anybody. You know, how he does it is up to him. I know that rubs some people the wrong way because they thought, oh, you're talking to the dead. I'm telling you right now, they're not dead. Even God said, or Jesus said, that, he, that the Father is not the, the, the uh, God of the dead, he's the God of the living. I can't not say he will do it or he won't do it because he's God. Right. Do you understand what I mean in that sense? But I know that whatever message that the Father wants to get to you will get to you. Some of you, um, some of you in this room, most of the time hear God by your thoughts. Am I correct? But some of you have heard him audibly. You know, you've heard some voice and you knew it was God. Some of you in this room that don't, you say they were crazy people. I know they were crazy people. <laughs> but the bottom line, I'm telling people this. The, the way that God really tries to get through is just to thought, thought to thought. Because that is pure communication. When you hear an audible voice, it's mostly because you ain't listening thought to thought. <laughs> I'm not saying it always happens that way, but that's what they're there. You know, it's, you kind of like close down, but he will get the message through. You could be on your dying bed at the end of your life, and God will always send somebody to talk to you if you have not made a decision for him. He will. He doesn't leave anybody out. That's how much he loves you. My wife we used to work in the metal field. You saw her up there. And many times she went in people's patients' rooms just before they died and led them to the Lord. And the family never knew about it. Can I make a statement? Please. I always say this. You that are in this room, you that pray, it is awful hard for somebody to go to hell when someone's praying for them. I'm not saying... They don't have their own free will. I'm not saying they don't have their own choice, but they are going up against God Almighty. And 
God wants them there. Wants them there more than you do. And he knows their thoughts, their, their, their next move. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you were in the bar when they started preaching. Don't laugh too loud. We won't identify you, okay? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's been that he will do everything he can to get someone where he is because he loves them that much, short of evil. He will not do evil to, to get it done. Boy. Yeah, I'm going to ask you something. I don't know if you answer it or not. If you drive down Middle Country Road, you're going to see a bunch of uh, signs that say psychic readings. Uh, you turn on the TV, you can watch Jonathan Edwards crossing over. You, mm -hmm. We have this lady called the Long Island Medium that's on this, the Discovery Channel. Um, you know, they claim all that they're hearing voices of people who passed on. Yes. What is your understanding of that? Or? Well, and this would probably be somebody that people that pass on to the Father are in life. People that pass on without the Father or without Jesus Christ, they're in death. People say, what do you mean by that? Separation from God is death. That's what it really is. Okay? Those people that are passed on that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and that are separated, there is a holding place, which we call hell, and that's where they are. Those voices that anybody else is hearing from anywhere else, if the person didn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're not hearing it from that relative. They're hearing it from what we call a familiar spirit. That's what they're hearing it from. Okay, the bitch is which is mimicking a family member. Okay, so I want to put that out there right now. Okay, so you just don't go by that in a sense like that. You don't have to hear from a relative, number one. You can hear from Jesus Christ. You can hear from Jesus Christ. Okay, you don't have to hear from a relative. I know some people do it because they're grieving, they're hurting, they want to know something. But I'm telling you right now, you can hear from Jesus Christ. Okay? So, in that sense, that's what I came to understand. It is a spiritual world, you know. Most of us don't realize we were not created to be in the temporal world, which is this physical world. We were created to be in the spiritual realm. And everybody ends up sooner or later in the spiritual realm, either in the life part or in the death part. Okay? And so those that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they end up in the life part. Did that answer your question? I think so. But I think just for some of the people who, who may have had some experiences, not necessarily by going to a psychic, but by believing that they may have heard from their relative who passed on, I think when we have talked, you said, you know, obviously it's always God's will, mm -hmm. but that's certainly that's things that can happen. It is possible because Elijah and Moses came down to talk to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So it is possible, okay? You know, I just tell people to caution because if you're going other places, there's other familiar spirits. Just go to Jesus. He'll tell you. Seriously, you guys, you know, he'll tell you. You know, I'll be honest with you, whoever you're talking to outside of Jesus, they don't get you in. <laughs> you can get up there and say, I was talking to my Aunt Martha, she said I can come in. <laughs> She's going to say, well, I don't see myself on the inside of you. I see Aunt Martha on the inside of you, she ain't coming in. <laughs> I, I'm putting it out there, we laugh, but I'm serious. You know. Jesus gets you in. You know, we can do that. And I'm not discounting anybody that's had that type of experience because it is possible. But I'm also putting the caution out there in the sense that there are familiar spirits. Okay? There are demons and devils and evil spirits that want to mimic things to get you off kilter. Jeffrey Dahm Dahmer. Would, okay? What did he say he heard? He heard these voices telling him to do what he was doing. You're going to tell me that was Jesus telling him to do that? Now everybody in this room agrees. That's what happens. Jesus will not tell you to do anything that's evil. Okay? He will not lead you down a road that will put death in anyone's life. And a lot of times when you come to the end of some of these conversations that people have in these psychic areas are these... Uh, um, what do you call it? Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards, Edwards you know, readings. Okay. Before long, they're 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 no longer their media media guides or their people that are, you know, things like that. 
And they go into t- weird stuff that is really out there that has nothing to do with life. It has everything to do with death. You know, leave your husband because he's such a bad guy and, he, and, and, and leave the kids because they're all rotten kids <laughs> and, 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 and go out with this other man. You guys know what I'm talking about. Okay, you know, th- th- they say, well, I heard it from God. God wouldn't do that. God would not do that. Okay? I'm not talking about people that are being battered. You know what I mean? Beaten up and, and, and hurt. God wants to protect them, yes. But in the end of the sense, you've got a good relationship and you're doing what you're supposed to do and all of a sudden your spouse says, no, I'm hearing that I'm supposed to leave you because this voice is telling me and I heard it from God. What's the justification? Do you guys hear me? You know, you've got to test those spirits. You've got to, you gotta, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, filter them out. Is this of God or is this of the devil? Because he wants to destroy you. He comes to kill, kill, and destroy. Jesus Christ said he comes to give you life and life more abundantly. Well, what would you get me into these things for? Well, because I, these are spiritual folks. You know, I thought you were my friend, is, man. Well, <laughs> I'll buy you a gift then. I'm glad I'm leaving and you're staying. <laughs> When you saw Jesus, did he know that you wanted to thank him just by looking into your heart? Oh, man. Yes, he knew it. How do you know? Everything about him. Um, man, how could I? That's just. How do I take this and put that in words? Everything about him loved me, number one. Excuse me, loved me, number one. <coughs> Everything about him was ready to receive any, any admiration that I gave him. You just know it. He just, it just, this came into him. You know? One of the reasons I tell people now, because someone asked me, said, what were you really thanking him for? Uh, and you guys that don't know the story, when I first reached Jesus, I looked at him and I said, you did this for me. And what I was saying was, the only reason I was there is because of him dying on that cross. That's why I got in. And the next words that came out of my mouth was, thank you, 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 thank you. And I tell people, everything about me was thanking him. If I would have stopped thanking him with my mouth, my hand would have kept on doing it. Seriously. And if I would have stopped thanking him with my hand, my feet would have kept on doing it. Everything about me was thanking him. And someone said to me, well, what were you really thanking him for? Every moment that he did something in my life was being revealed to me. And it was like, out of 10, out of 10, if 10 was the greatest of knowing everything that he did for me, I may have known one of 1% of all that he did for me. It was like, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You that are born again, you know there's a scripture that says he never leave you nor forsake you. And we don't really think about it, but he is there constantly doing things for us. Why don't you get me into that? Uh, wait, wait till you hear this one. My, my husband is Jewish. Will he be able to get to heaven? If he knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now I'm going to tell you something. Now I'm learning something by traveling this country, many people stick with their own what they call religion because they don't want to leave their family. You understand what I'm talking about? But when it comes down to that last moment, many of them jump ship. (laughs) I'm just telling you right now. You know, Jesus does so much. And I've heard it over and over. People say, my relative didn't believe in Jesus. And then when that time came, they were the jump ship. You know, I had a good uh, person I worked with. Her dad was a Buddhist. Buddhist her whole life. I went uh, to his funeral because she was a colleague of mine. And I remember coming into the room, and it was at a Presbyterian service. And she sat with her brothers and her mom on one side, and then there was this minister and this other lady sitting on this side. And, as long, I, and I worked with her for three years. And I've heard about her brothers. But she had a sister. And her sister was born again. 
And when her sister became born again, they kicked her out of the family. You guys hear me? But guess what her sister did? When her daddy was getting ready to die, she brought that minister over there, and guess what he did? He accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. <laughs> you know, it was at the last moment, okay, and someone, I would have wished it was earlier, but he still did. Um, I don't know, I just, the second time somebody's, I got this, is, you know, what did Mary in the back ask you? But I don't know, we got to ask Mary in the back. Yeah, ask Mary in the back. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we, can't, we can't do that to poor Mary. Hopefully uh, Mary's question will come up, I guess. All right, uh, doctor, if I've heard that you only use 20% of your brain, I'm not saying you in particular. <laughs> Maybe it's more. <laughs> What's the other eighty percent of it used for? You know, I is it used I, for spiritual things? That's you know, you know, I didn't learn this in heaven, but I will tell you something. When I came back, I did research on that part, and that's really not true. You use all of your brain. Your brain is being used all the time for a lot of things. They just don't understand everything that is being is done. That's what really is. If you ask any really brain surgeon or anybody. They just don't understand. They don't have the knowledge of understanding everything about your brain. So the term that came out, you only use 20%, that's really not true. You can look it up. You can do the research. It's really you use more of your brain than you. I know some of you had hope that maybe I, you had more brain you could use to get smarter and things like that. And I'm not saying you're at the end of your intelligence, but you are using everything you can, according to the medical records. <laughs> And I know you have kids that you're hoping, oh boy, I wish they'd... <laughs> like Nico Baloba, I guess a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> if you accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you don't really have a relationship with him, will you still go to heaven? You know, that's, that's between you and him. He knows the heart. There is a part in the Bible that talks about people that did a whole bunch of things they said in the name of Jesus. They did this in his name, they did that in his name. It's really found you that want to read your Bible in the seventh chapter of uh, Matthew. And he said, depart from me, for I knew you not. It means when that time came for them to enter in, he says, I didn't know you. And the, really the word means I had not a approving relationship with you. That's what it really means, okay? I can't tell you whether a person has an approving relationship or not. Jesus would tell you. It's up to him. Which is really good because some of you have an approving relationship and you're trying to prove to everybody else that you have an approving relationship. You need to stop. It's a done deal. You're free. Were there sports in heaven? <laughs> Well, I, I can't say they're literally sports, but I can tell you that you are going to have fun. God is the creator of fun. He knows to have more fun than you can ever imagine. Most of the time in these types of situations, if the kids are asking questions, they're asking it from this point of view, is it going to be fun there? They are not planning on going to a boring heaven. <laughs> you know what I mean? One of them asked me, well, is there going to be all the video games you can ever play? I said, do you know the technology of God is, is way ahead of anything on this planet? And I said, he made us. We way behind. You know? So I just tell him that. But you, you, in the sense of sports, because most people enjoy sports because they have fun, you're going to have fun. If you never knew your biological parents, will you know them, be united with them if they gave you away or, or with the parents that were Your you? family will be there. Your adopted family will be there because you're part of their family, and your biological family will be there to greet you in. So then what, what happens with uh, aborted babies? They're, they're, aborted babies are, are already there, okay, number one. They will come to greet their family in too. What, what about mom, the one who aborted them? If she's born again, they will come to greet her in. And then what kind of relationship will she have with them? A pure relationship than she could ever imagine. It will be, it will be, there won't be, oh, you aborted me, I'm here, I wish you wouldn't have done that or anything like that. There's none of that there. There's no grudges there. There's no, oh, oh regrets there. It's gone, you guys. All that stuff is gone. No one's bringing it up there. 
You don't have a, a pack over here that says, oh, you got to you, you gotta get a little bit better before we let you in, that type of thing. It's all gone. Jesus takes care of it. Everything changed. Everything is right. It's past peace. There's nothing to be peaceful from. What does it mean when a deceased loved one passes on and they come to you in your dream? Again, if that is of the Father, okay, I can't tell you that. Uh, what it really means because the Lord is always trying to communicate with us. But again, that's one of those that I tell people uh, in the sense that um, you got to make sure that it's from God. And I know somebody said you're not supposed to talk to the dead. I always say they're not dead, they're alive. I thought they were all held up there in heaven like it's a jail. Elijah and Moses came down, you guys. I'm just putting out the one scripture for you Bible people out there. That said, they came out of jail. You said, was well, they in jail? It's heaven. You're right. Bottom line. I don't have the, the answer to all of that because I'm not God. Praise God. <laughs> I have a hard time feeling that God loves me. Intellectually, I know, but on a heart level, I don't feel it. What does God's love feel like? Then I will do this, okay? I don't know who that is, but the Lord does. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that person that wrote that note right now, literally have them experience to the fullness of the love that you created for them that only they can receive. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So you said it wasn't your time yet. Not speaking about those who are still lost or deliberate acts of will. I don't understand yeah. that. But for the for those that are sons and daughters of the Most High God, did you get any sort of clarification that our times are in His hands? That is, He who holds the keys to life and death. In the sense of going early, um, going late, you know, I had a, um, a belief system that when I would leave this planet, it would be by my time. Okay, my time. Well, when I left, I found out. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And I found out that literally you can leave this planet before your time. Someone said, how do you know? Because when I got there, he looked at me and said, no, it's not your time, go back. Okay. And I know this, that the Bible even says, when it talks about communion in the second, um, in second Corinthians 11 chapter, that some leave this planet before their time, when it talks about communion. So we know it can happen. Um, there's times when it says, if you honor your father and your mother, literally you can have a long life on this planet. So that means you can even extend your time on this planet. My mind just said, why you would do that? I don't know. <laughs> but I know if that's what God wants, you can extend your time. We, you that read your Bible know that Hezekiah, he prayed, and he got 15 more years added to his time on this planet. So that whole time thing, I don't have a good understanding of it. I can tell you this, okay? I left before my time. Because I was born again, because I knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, because I had the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of me. Even though I left before my time, I went to heaven. Do you hear me? I died a terrible death. I suffocated. It, was, it wasn't one of those that people would vote, oh, let me suffocate. You understand what I mean? Matter of fact, I had really thought I had made an agreement with God that I would not suffocate when I died. Because I almost drowned when I was a little kid. All right? But the bottom line, I suffocated. Where did I go? I went to be where Jesus said we go. Do you hear me? I came to understand you, you could be born again and not believe that when you die, you go to heaven. There's a thing that some uh, denominations out there believe, soul sleeping. That means you go into the ground and you stay in the ground. I found out that that doesn't get you into heaven if you believe that. What gets you into heaven is Jesus Christ. So if you die, you go to heaven. You can argue with them when you get there. <laughs> you hear what I just said? Okay. The bottom line is, whatever happens to me, and whatever time it is, I still get to go to be where the Father in Jesus is. 
I don't lose. Is that good news, you guys? Yeah. So that's all I can say about the time thing. You're done good. Can your flesh hold you back? In which way? I guess from knowing that you have this uh, relationship with Jesus. Getting your flesh can get in the way of a whole bunch of stuff. Your flesh, most of you, we're spiritual beings, okay? And your flesh is heaven, is this planet. And so it says, what do you mean? It don't go to hell, nor does it go to heaven. It lives on this planet, it stays on this planet. You that are born again know that the Bible says you will get a new body, you will get new flesh. It will be made up of the same DNA, but it will not have any impact of sin in it. Amen. You will not get old. Some of you that are trying right now not to get old <laughs> and doing everything you can, I'm telling you, there will come a day when you will experience never aging. What if you're old already? Oh, you will never age. It, it, it's not there, okay? So in that case, this is what, that's why your struggle is a lot of times is really with your own flesh, with your own body, because it's trying to make itself as comfortable as it can on this planet. Okay, so in that case, it doesn't leave. It doesn't even go where we say hell. Even though you hear the Bible describe a person experiencing hell from a fleshly point of view. And someone says, what's going on there? This is what really happens. If you're born again and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when you leave this body, you literally take all the good things with you. And you leave all the bad things here. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior when you leave this body, you take all the bad things with you. See? So when you're experiencing the, the hell and things like that, you're experiencing from a fleshly point of view, and yet you're not flesh anymore. I know people, whoa. That's out there, isn't it? So that's just, I'm just letting you know. Uh, God, help them to understand, please. <laughs> Amen. How do I know if I'm going to heaven? How do you know? Yeah. Ask Jesus. He'll tell you. Just ask him. He'll tell you. So that means Jesus, he, he'll, he'll listen to anybody. It doesn't make a difference. You don't have to be a certain religion. No. He'll listen to anybody. Most of the prayers that were passing me by when I was going to, um, to be with the Father and Jesus were people that were asking God for help. So and, it wasn't, and it wasn't people that we would say were born again. It was people that didn't know God or didn't know, and they were asking God for help. That was most of the prayers. And what happened? What happened to those prayers? Where did they go? They went to the Father. They went to, they went to, to the Father God. That's what. And was, was he responding to them? Oh, yes, he was responding. Yeah. That was part of what you said before about all heaven is focused on yes. trying to get people yeah. to make it to heaven. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of people around us. They may not say it, but when they're in their room by themselves or they're by themselves and they're thinking about their lives, they're thinking, Lord, I want, I want something better than this. And they say, God, if you're real, I want to know that you're real and can you help me? Amen. Simple prayer. But he's hearing it. And he is doing things. Some of you are in this room right now, prayed that prayer. That's why you're here. You know what I mean? You're literally hearing from a person that had a bona fide death, what we call, that went to be where Jesus and the Father is. And so he, he's doing what he can to verify to you that he's real. I may not be answering all the questions like the way that you like to hear them, but you can't deny that I went somewhere. You may say, well, you're hallucinated. You don't know what you're talking about. And all I got to say to that answer is you will find out. And it's better you find out on this planet. Oh, boy. Somebody said, oh, boy, you put me in a box right there. <laughs> well, the, the choice you're going to have to make is what, what you're going to do with that information now. And the best choice to make is to, is to is, as one guy said, if, if you really are God, then I need to accept you. It's that simple. You God, I need to accept you. Don't worry about, I need to get rid of this, get rid of that, get rid of that. Most people that come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they don't try to get rid of a bunch of stuff beforehand. God helps them to get rid of it afterhand. 
addictions to drugs and alcohol, uh, por pornography. Um, you've got uh, all these things that you, God helps you get rid of them. And those that are around you that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they each have a unique testimony, and they'll always tell you it was God that helped them get rid of that stuff. Because they know themselves. You know. Am I right, James? You are absolutely right. How did you perceive time in heaven? There is no time in heaven. I mean, you didn't need your watch. No, I didn't need a watch. When I say Jesus said, no, it's not your time, go back, he was really saying, no, it's not your moment to be here, go back. He wouldn't look at his watch, hey, teen, you've been here too long, get out of here. <laughs> he didn't say that. He wasn't doing that. That wasn't what he was doing. He was just, it was not my time to leave this planet to be in heaven. But understand one thing, I'm on my way home. I'm headed straight back there. And I always tell people, this is the pathway that God has said I have to go to get there. You're in this room. This isn't me. This is not me. This is building me up. The Lord loved you so much that he sent me back to give you this moment. Amen. Did I volunteer to do it? No. But because he loved you so much, when I got there, he knew that this day was coming. He knew I would be in this church. He knew I would be with these people here so that you had the opportunity to hear from him through this experience. That's how much he loves you. There's a scripture that states you and your household or your yeah. family will be saved. Um, do you have any insight into what that really means? That means, number one is that if you're praying for somebody in your family, you've got to understand that prayers don't have a shelf life. If you're praying from your heart for somebody in your family, that prayers don't have a shelf life. Even if you go on to be with the Father in Jesus, God will still honor that prayer. Many of you in this room right now that have made that decision for God, you, it was really you were prayed in by a great, great, great grandparent. Because, especially grandmas, grandmas just don't know when to stop praying for your ancestors. They'll pray for you, they'll pray for the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. They just don't stop. Okay? So those prayers don't have a shelf life. So when, when uh, that scripture was said uh, by Joshua, it said, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That was literally a prayer that was sent out. And anybody in that household, God is still working on that prayer for that family. It doesn't have a shelf life. You can do the same for your family. Okay, and I know somebody said, well, I want to see them saved on this planet. Remember what I experienced when I was in heaven? Okay, you can see here on this planet or you can see it there. Either way, you're going to enjoy it. Okay, now we got the age-old correct question. It can be rephrased. Does what happens if somebody's a really good person? And they do really good things, and they're kind and loving, but not necessarily a Christian. Well, you mean born again, okay? Because Christians, people could call themselves Christians and not be born again, too. Okay. Okay. So if they're, I'm going to clarify that and say not born again, hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they say they're a good person. I um, have a friend named Bill Wise. He's the one that wrote, many of you, the book that called 23 Minutes in Hell. He had an out-of-body experience where he went to hell. And he experienced hell. Um, we did a, a church together in Georgia where he did the um, hell side and I did the heaven side. Okay. When he met me, he said, man, I sure wish I would have went to heaven. <laughs> and I looked at him and just smiled. <laughs> I wasn't saying I sure wish I would have went to hell. <laughs> but he, he, he had a really good um, uh, answer to that question. Um, but I'm going to preface it with another answer and then answer that question. He was being interviewed by a radio station and they said, we don't want you to bring up any scriptures or anything about the Bible and anything that you say. So he, they asked him, why is God or Jesus the only way to get in? Isn't there another way? And he said, okay, look at it this way. I have a house on top of a hill. I'm going to tell you how to get to my house. You can try all the other ways, but there's only one way to get to my house. You can go this way, that way, and then get into my house. This is the way it is. What God is doing says, I've got a house. 
I want you in my house. I'm telling you how to get into my house. Then someone said, but what about good people? They're good and things like that. He said, okay, I have this house on top of a hill. You come and knock on my door and you say, I'm a good person, let me in. How do I know you're a good person? I don't know anything about you. I don't have a relationship with you. How do I know you're a good person? How many of you will let someone in your house just because they come knocking on the door and saying they're a good person? Okay? That's not going to get you in. What's going to get you in is to come in the way that he said that you need to come in. It's really not a difficult way. It really isn't. And you've heard me over and over tonight say it over and over again. Hey, he looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. He didn't say, Dean, um, where's the resume? How many works did you do down there? You know, um, you know, you, you, you eat pizza with pineapple on it. They just don't have it up here. <laughs> Our New, New Yorkers don't eat that pizza with pineapple on it. <laughs> We over there on the West Coast, we eat a lot of things on our pizza. You know what I mean? But the bottom line is I'm letting you know all, it was as simple as I'm saying it. He looked at me, saw himself on the inside of me, and I got in. Not even my works got me in. I came to know it's his works through me. Couldn't even take credit for that. So tonight if you're here, that's how simple it is. Some of us, we get into the thing and say, no, it's more than that. I gotta work for it. I gotta do this, I gotta do that. That's usually your flesh trying to justify itself. Okay? But the bottom line is, all the Lord is ever asking when to do is to accept him as Lord and Savior. And he will come in. The rest of the stuff he will work on. None of us came in perfect. Some of us think we were perfect and then we got in, we found out how messed up we really were. <laughs> You know, there, there's a story uh, in Washington of a revival that took place in the um, uh, 18, I got to say like 1831, 32, 33. This is a long time ago. And it was among the Native Americans, the Indian tribes out there. And a man from this area called Jason Lee was sent back there to minister to the Native American people back there. And he was preaching. He was preaching to five different tribes, so he had five different interpreters. He did it for a number of days, and on the third day, they said something like hot wax fell from the sky. And, he, and, and this was a chief, a uh, uh, white swan, is given, he was a Yakima chief, and he's given this testimony. And he said, he said um, when it fell from the sky, all of a sudden we, we thought we were good, but we found out we weren't good. And this is his words, and we bowed down and accepted this Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said they went off into the woods praying like songbirds. Mm. A lot of times you think, I got it together. I'm good. I'm doing all this together. You accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you find out, I missed it. But the good thing about it, Jesus said, yeah, you missed it, but now you ain't missed it no more. <laughs> you know, now you in. And you don't have to perform to get in. You in. Is that good news? Good news. Can I ride a horse in heaven? I yeah. don't ride him because I'm, I'm afraid. What? She doesn't ride, or he doesn't ride one here because they're afraid. Let's, you, you'll ride as many horses as you want. Um, there's no fear there, so. No fear in heaven. Any of you are scared of anything because they got some creations up there that God has created that some of us would have a hard time with. But there's no fear. Fear is not existing in heaven. You think we're going to be able to get through all those? I'm hoping. <laughs> I've, I've had a number of these, so I'll, I'll just ask you and get it out. It's, it's um, you know, basically comes down to can Jewish people go to heaven? If they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Is you guys, you, don't, you don't, don't limit our Father, please. You understand what I'm talking about? He knows them better than you do. He knows exactly the words that need to be said. He knows when to say it. He knows how to show up. He knows how to reveal himself. Anybody that's searching for God will find him. Because he, does, he wants to be found. Amen. 
okay? And I know we think someone so hard, so, so, so don't got it together. There was a president that I think was one of the presidents that kind of steered us in a, in, a, in a wrong way, and it was An Andrew Jackson. He was the one that came up with the Indian Removal Act. And some of you have heard of the tear of trails by the Cherokee Nation. Well, there were really five nations that got moved over into Oklahoma, and everyone that experienced thousands of people because of that Indian Removal Act that Andrew Jackson. If you read his history, he did a lot more of the things that we're paying prices for right now in America. But you know who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at, at the end of his life? Andrew Jackson. And, and, and the father didn't stop him saying, hey, 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 you messed up back there. Go clean it up. He let him in. He was up there when I was there. Okay. That's our father. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to reach everybody. There is not an unreachable person on this planet for God. Now they have a choice to choose what they want, but he will make it hard for them to choose the other way. It's like when you that know your Bible, it's like when Pharaoh saw all those miracles happening for the Hebrew people and he still chose the wrong way, but he could not deny all the miracles that took place. Now, how many of you going to see those type of miracles and finally say, no, nah, I don't want God? <laughs> Most of us are, ain't that stubborn. You understand what I'm talking about? And some of us that think we're that stubborn, we're not. Because when it comes to death, you can't beat death. And it's at your door. I'm telling you right now, you're going to say, hey, is this way or that way? They say, this way is a good way. I'm going this way. You're going to be surprised how many people that you didn't think made it from your relatives that is there. But please don't be too surprised, because they're going to be surprised you there too. <laughs> no. Well, thank you for watching our interview with Dean Braxton, the author of In Heaven. Um, how are you kidneys and your organs now? I, I always tell people I have no residue. Um, for the next three months after this happened, they brought me into the hospital. They did tons of tests. Uh, you that are in the medical field know what happened. I was sepsis. That means poison was out throughout my entire body. It wasn't just that my heart was went, it, my lungs went, my kidney went. Every organ in my body shut down. That's what really happened. The medical record said 29 different things went wrong with this body from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. Um, on the bio channel, it said that they were pumping uh, doing CPR on me and that kept oxygen going through my brain. Anyone in the medical field knows it's not adequate enough. I should be coming, I should have come back truly at the most. You know what I mean? I should not have any function brain-wise at all. Any medical person will tell you that. The other thing that happened is because of the sepsis, my toes lost circulation and they died. Okay? And they were planning to cut my toes off. That's what they were doing. But literally, God healed my brain, he healed my toes. I have no residue <laughs> at all. So when, after this took place, what happened was they, they literally brought me into the hospital for the next three months and did tests on me. They did it not because uh, they just wanted to find out what they did. They did it because they wanted to see if they could redo it for others. Because most people that go through what I go through don't make it. Okay, that's just the way it is. It's just that bad. Because you got, you can have a lung specialist, you can have a heart specialist, and, and you can try to do it this way, and this uh, reacts against this negative. It's like medication. You know how medication, this medication may help this area, but then you're going to have this area that's in trouble. And I had every organ in this body shutting down, not operating. So it wasn't like one thing. It was so many things. It was like, and that doctor up there, as you could tell, um, tomorrow morning, we'll show the 700 interview. And in the 700 interview, they really go into the, we're going to show that tomorrow morning? Yes, sir. And that one really goes into the doctor's reactions and the things that they did. And he'll tell you right off, it is truly a miracle. But I have no residue. I have none. Did you see the doctors working on you when you left or when you returned? When I left, patients? I wasn't looking back, number one. <laughs> Okay. When I returned, I saw them looking on me, and they were 
and they were they were they were chaotic. They were running around. They were doing all this stuff. You can see all that stuff, you know. And and I that was me saying that. And when you see the interview tomorrow morning on the Seven Hundred Club, that's what they say. It was chaotic. It was panicking in that room. And and when you when you got back, did your uh, did your body have anything to say to you? Is that on there? Is that on there? Yeah. <laughs> now my brother is really getting ready to stress some of you, so I'm gonna go ahead and stretch you. You know, my my body, I was laying in my bed and it said something to me, and I know it was a voice from my body. It said, You will never do that to me again. <laughs> because I when you leave, your body dies. That's what that's what I heard. And so how is that different from how our bodies might talk to us? Well, I hope you don't have to go through that same experience. I don't hope that anybody goes to heaven and come back. The coming back is not as great as most people think it is. And people will come up to me and say, I'm glad you're back. I'll just smile. Okay? This earth does not compare to where the Father and Jesus is. Okay? So I hope that that never happens to you, James. I hope when you leave this planet, you leave one time, and that's it. You're not going to have anything to do with that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because I really believe my wife and others prayed, and that also contributed to me coming back to this planet. And I thought I had agreement with my wife that um, when one of us died, the other one wouldn't pray him back. She reneged on that agreement. <laughs> there goes that living will, huh? Yeah. All right. uh, when a child dies, is the experience any different for them? I don't believe so. I believe that they leave, most children, boy, they leave very peaceful, you know what I mean? Um, I've heard story after story of children that even know beforehand that they're gonna go be going home. And they tell parents that, and most parents don't wanna hear it, because it, it is a tragic thing for a child to leave early like that. But they seem to be leaving in peace. My first encounter of having to talk to someone that was dying and leaving this planet was a 12-year-old little girl named Gloria Strauss. Her parents wanted me to come and talk to her because she had cancer and she was in the last little bit of her cancer on this planet. That was hard. I'm going to tell you that right now. I prayed for healing for her. Don't get me wrong. All right. She wanted to know would she be able to see her family from heaven when she got there. Okay, and I let her know, yes, she would. Okay, be able to see her family if God wanted to see. And so um, in that case, they say about two weeks later, she went home to be with the Lord. Okay, and she's there waiting to greet her family when they come in. Why do you think that God chose you to have this experience? Now I'm going through my headset. Don't nobody think this is an honor. You know what I mean? Going to heaven and coming back. It's not like going to Disneyland. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Or, or any of the other amusement parks and then coming back and telling people how much fun they had. Uh-uh. You know, you're leaving a, a perfect realm to come back into a imperfect realm. Why he chose me, um, my pastor would tell you is because my heart was right. Okay? I don't think about it. I just do what he wants me to do because I know I'm on my way home. I don't go and try to say, I was chosen for this reason, I was chosen for that reason. I'm on my way back home. I'm going to do what he wants me to do on this planet with all of the love that he's given me to do it in. And, but I'm on my way home. So I can't tell you why he chose me. Well, that goes right into this question. It says, do you have any input? This is our, I guess, religious person who knows some doctrine. What do you say about Calvinism or predestination? Which means that you know God uh, chooses beforehand who is going to believe in Him and who's not. I just know this: for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will have everlasting life. Jesus said, "I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him may come to know Je may have everlasting life." I just know one thing: He loves them all. He wants them all there. He's chosen them all to be there. I just, that's our Lord. Now the choice is up to us whether we go or not. 
but he has been, he's chosen everyone to be there. He has a place for them. Did you, do you miss or grieve the absence of non-believing family or friends when you're in heaven? Do you miss? I guess if you were up there and there's people there that you love, but they weren't there, did you have a feeling of missing them or grieving for them? Or? You know, you don't miss like you think you would miss because um, the Father and Jesus fill in every gap. There is no missing. There isn't, everything's right. And the sense of not knowing who's there and who's there, um, I really didn't know that when I was there until I got back here. You know what I mean? I knew who was there, but I didn't know who was missing because it was filled in. It was like... God would not let you go through that agony or that pain. So, it's almost like when you lose a loved one down here on this planet and how the Lord comes in to fill in that area of that loss. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Some of you have experienced it. You know what I mean? He just seems to do it. You know no counseling could do it. None of that stuff. It's God that did it for you. you know? So for people then who have suffered loss, you would encourage them then to allow God to come in, Jesus to fill that void yes. to that loved one. Yeah. Because you'll be experiencing a little bit of heaven. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we can choose not to do that. We can yeah. choose to just focus on the fact that they're not there and, you know, and that's kind of. You're going to miss pleasure. them because we were never meant to be separated. That yeah. wasn't God's plan. That happened because of sin. But the bottom line is that God can help you get through that area with comfort. It doesn't mean you're negating them or you're discounting them on this planet. You know what I mean? When babies die, do they grow up in heaven? Uh, there's no time in heaven. You know, so when you say grow up, how do you measure that? You know, you can't say someone's a million years old. What does that look like? <laughs> you know what I mean? I know some down, down on this planet, we look at people and say, you look like you're a million years old. <laughs> but the bottom line, there's no time. So there's no measurement in the sense of growth. Someone said one time, is there children there? Are there babies there? And I have to say this to them, they're complete. What do I really mean by that? It's hard for me to tell you because there's no growing up. They're complete. You that have lost a loved one, you that's a child or had an abortion or a miscarriage, that child will come to greet you in, but they're complete. Will they need you to mother them anymore? No, they won't. But your relationship with them will be past any, um, uh, what, any, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, way that you would have mothered them anyway. It's even greater than that. I just don't have anything to relate to that. Okay, on this planet. You guys, it's greater. You know, you're not missing out when you get there. You will gain a whole lot. If we're meant to be together for eternity with family, how do we help them to accept and believe in Jesus? Keep on praying. You keep on praying for them. You keep on praying for them. You got to remember, the Father and Jesus wants them there more than you do. You're not on a losing team. Is that good news? Is heaven anything like earth? Earth was modeled after heaven. The problem is earth has deterioration and death in it now. When, if you, when it was first created, the model was heaven. So many of the things that you see here, sadly to say, are way different because of the deterioration and the death that's here. But you see things, you're going to see them there. Well, I guess that would answer this question. It says, do you believe in physics? Yeah. You see everything's breaking down, right? I think that's the third law of thermodynamics, the law yeah. of entropy. Yeah. That's physics. Okay. <laughs> You're a believer. If someone commits suicide, do they go to heaven and um, have the same happy experience? This is what I have to say, okay? Um, there's a pastor here. Is there another pastor in this room? Any other pastors? Okay, there's a pastor right here. Any others? Anybody else? Okay, I would ask you to get with them and talk to them or talk to your own pastor if you come from a different church, okay? I make this statement and I make it strong because I've had people that have come to the meetings and their major goal is for me to approve them killing themselves. 
Okay? Did you hear what I just said? They want me to say something that says if they kill themselves, they'll go to heaven. I have to say this. Murderers don't go to heaven. All right? But I have to say this. You need to take that question, whoever that was, take the details of that situation and talk to a pastor. All right? Because I don't want to let anyone out here think that if they leave this building today and you have church people that come to church all the time and this is their last resort and they're saying, if I don't get anything from God, I'm going home tonight and I'm doing it, or I'm going home and I'm doing it. So I cannot tell you that people that commit suicide go to heaven. But whoever that was, I'm asking you to get with your pastor or get with these two men here or anyone that they say and talk to them personally, please. Please do that because I don't know the circumstances. And then you can describe the circumstances to them and they can give you more of an answer. Is that, is that okay, Nicholas? Is that okay? Um, what's your name again? Dennis. Huh? Dennis. Dennis. Pastor Dennis right there. Can you raise your hand again? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I need help. Okay? <laughs> I'm just going to put that out. I'm putting that out. I need help with that one. Because that is such a delicate one. I was in a meeting one time, and I'm talking, and I'm talking about suicide, and I'm talking about things, and all of a sudden, someone says, well, someone says, Dean, you're giving me permission to kill myself. And I had to say, no, I'm not. Because they were looking for me to give them permission to kill themselves. Do you understand what I mean? And it's just like in our state, I don't know with New York, but in our state, we have assisted suicide. The medical doctors can help put someone out of their misery in the state of Washington and in the state of Oregon, okay? So that, that is a real issue in our state. And you have people, because of they're suffering with physical ailments, that they want to get out of it, so they think this is the best way to do it. Do you guys hear me? Yes. So that, that's the only reason I'm asking you guys for help on this one. So please, whoever asked that question, if you're still in this room, please look up these men or go to your own pastor or, and talk to them, whoever they are, and tell them the circumstances of your situation, please. What was the initial point throughout your experience that completely changed and spiritually impacted your life? When I was gone, you think, they're saying? I think it's really probably what was the, the, the probably the most impactful thing that changed you, you know, spiritually. And when I went to heaven? Yeah. The whole um, experience. Yeah. Just the, the love of the Father. To know how much he loves us. When I looked in his eyes and I saw the love he has for us, I knew Jesus Christ loved us, not to the extent that I experienced it, but I knew it. But to see the Father's love for us, for as the Bible says, for God to love the world, he gave his only begotten son. And I thought, man, look at this love. To the point that I knew that the Father would do anything he could short of evil to get us into his, into his kingdom, into his relationship with us. And we know with Jesus Christ, okay, that's short of evil. But still, the intensity of it was just there. So now uh, that has really impacted me to know how much he really loves you. That's why sometimes when people pray and I say, why wouldn't he? He's your father. And how's your experience impacted and changed your prayer life? Most of my prayer life after I ask once is praise. I always praise him for the answer now. I asked him once for something, now I give him praise for the answer. Okay, that's how it's changed my life. Another one is, um, well I learned a whole bunch about prayer by going through that process. And you know, prayers don't have a shelf life. You know what I mean? That a prayer, prayer from the heart, and it has to be a heart prayer, doesn't have a shelf life. If you wonder if it's a heart prayer, ask him. He'll tell you if it's a heart prayer, and then you can change it into a heart prayer, and don't have a shelf life. We have a God that hears prayer everywhere. We don't have to be in one spot for him to hear us. We have a God that can answer prayer anytime, anywhere. You know? 
I, I came to understand, literally, and people will say this is a really uh, narrow thinking, but we have the only God that hears prayer. You know? And so it's like, some would say, well, what about this guy's God, that guy's God? I don't know about their gods. I know my God is the only God that hears prayer. And so, well, that's pretty narrow. I said, well, you'll find out. <laughs> I, I just got to go there. You'll find out. It, it, you see, all this stuff that we, we debate about, everybody's going to have knowledge about sooner or later. <coughs> you know, that's, that's, that's settled. And so, um, and so that's, a, you know, really changed my life in the sense of prayer. And for me, I use the term, not so much I'm praying, I'm going home. Because to me, when I pray, I'm like going home. When you saw your family in heaven, how did you recognize them in the spirit? Um, you just know in the spirit realm. You perceive it with everything besides sight, but you know. You know. Again, um, we want to look at the physical uh, aspects of our relatives. And I think the gr most glorious thing that I really got to experience is I got to see my grandmother with pure joy. I got to see my grandmother shining with Jesus. I got to see my grandmother literally with no worries. How many of us on this planet get to see anyone that we love as a family member in that state? And that's what was more glorifying than what they really look like, is that I got to see them in a state that does not exist on this planet. Where does everyone live or stay? And do they always get to see Jesus? Well, uh, hold on. Where do they live and stay? Well, they live with the Father and Jesus. That's number one. That's hard for us to comprehend. There is no lines in heaven. Everyone has a front seat row with the Father and Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit, which is God Almighty himself on the inside of you. So you, you want to see him. You can thank it and you'll be before him every moment. You know, just travel is not... I'm going to get up this morning and move. You thank it, and you're there. That's how quick it is. So in that sense, it's almost like it's hard for me to answer that because it's coming from this point of view. And from a heavenly point of view, it's like, how could you not see him? How could you not be with him? You know what I mean? So it's hard to, and I know that it, someone wants to see it from this point of view. But for me to answer, it's hard for me to answer it because it's like, there's no way you cannot see him. You have front row with Jesus even now. You have access to the Father even now. Everybody in this room, even if you don't know God or Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you still have access to the Father. Did you hear what I just said? You know, most of us think we're standing in a line. There's no lines in heaven. Everybody's in the front. And so that's impossible. That's God. <laughs> That's who he is. He does the things outside of the things we think he can do. Is that good news? I get excited about it. <laughs> Did you get the understanding from Jesus or God that they turn away certain spirits? What kind of spirits? Certain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's no demonic spirits or evil spirits there, so if they're talking about those spirits, they're turned away already. But how, do, how do those spirits get turned their way here, like on this side of heaven? In which way? Well, We're I mean, talking about the same spirits? I think we're probably talking about, well, no, we wouldn't turn, turn away good spirits. But now here, right, there's a mixture. We yeah. experience the spiritual realm here on earth where there's good and evil spirits. Yeah. So maybe it's more helpful to ask... Is, well, is there a way to turn them away here? And if so, how? How do you do that? You know, um, James, uh, I can answer that a number of ways, and, 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 and it's, it would take a lot longer than we have here right now to do that, okay? And so when you're asking that question, it's like my mind has started almost to put together a good teaching on that, but I don't have time to teach it on this planet. Um, you that uh, go to uh, churches, this would be a good one for you to go to your pastors and talk to them about. They will give you some information that will help you out. If the one that wrote that, that, um, that um, question. question 
If you're in this building and you don't have a pastor to go to, I got two of them here that will help you out. Am I right today? I'm going to keep you here all night. You say, man, I'm never going where that dean goes to bed. He, he works, you know. You know why? And Nicholas knows this because he's worked with me before. It's not about Dean Braxton. It's about Jesus Christ. And I always tell people, you don't want Dean Braxton to touch you. You want Jesus Christ to touch you. And if a person's in this room and they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, especially in the sense of the, where, where these two men are standing, then they can be used as Jesus just as much as anybody else you know, in this room. But in the sense of you have to come to me and get the answer, Jesus works right through them too. It's about Jesus Christ. And someone says, you're talking religion again. I'm just telling you, you'll find out it's about Jesus Christ. And someone may say, you keep on going there. What am I supposed to do? I died and went to heaven. I experienced entering heaven by Jesus looking at me. You want me to come back and tell you a lie? I can only tell you the truth. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. Did Jesus show you the end times and where we might be in? And he really, he really didn't show me end times in the sense of detail. There's some information that was given to me. But in the sense of saying this is when time ends or that's when time ends, this is, he didn't really show all that stuff. And uh, what, what did he show you? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, a chapter in the book about it. Kind of, I think you well, there's a little chapter in the book that talks about these are the things he told me about the end of the age. But again, um, that's a long answer that um, I really don't have the... the um, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking right now of the short answers because I'm thinking we're past 10 o'clock. No, not yet, right? Oh, soon. soon. All right. Do, do you go back to heaven? <laughs> do you go back all the time? I, I left all the time. I try to make it a little bit easier for you. Do you go back to heaven? This is what I'm going to tell you about that, okay? When I came, I was praying with my wife one day. And I was laying on the floor, this was soon after, and I was just praying with her. And I remember saying to the father, I said, Father, it's like I never left. He said, you never did. I'll stop right there. Did you ask Jesus um, anything and say anything else? Then you did this for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There was the time when I looked into his eyes and I came to the full realization that he wants everyone there and there's not one person on this planet he does not want with him and I asked him the question even child molesters the reason I said child molesters because I have a background in the juvenile justice system and one of the biggest issues for me to deal with with kids that came into the juvenile justice system was child molesters I mean people that have been child molested and you can do I dealt with drugs alcohol mental health that was my specialty but when they were, they were molested, it was a whole different issue for me. And so I asked them the question, even child molesters, not because I didn't believe child molesters got in, I just thought they were at the end of the line. That's just me. And he looked at me and he said this to me, communication was not with words, it was thought to thought. He said, when you put a person in hell, they get out. They either, oh not hell, when you put a person in jail, they get out. They either get out because their time is up, or they get out, because they die, but they get out. Then he said, but when we put a person in hell, they are there for eternity. And then he said to me, who are you? And that emphasis to nullify what I have done. And, and I used that term, someone said, why did you say child ministers? I'm telling you why, am I picking on them? No, someone else might have had a different group. But that was the group that I was talking. Well, we want to thank you for coming uh, tonight to listen to Dean Brax and share his experience in heaven. One of the things that I want to clear up, because one of the guys came up and said something to me, which was good. When it was to that suicide thing that we were talking about, a suicide situation, I said the Bible says that, you know, anyone that commits murder will not enter into the kingdom of God. But there are people that have committed murder and repented. You understand what I'm talking about? And they have entered into the kingdom of God. But I was mainly talking about someone that kills themselves. They don't have a chance to go back and repent. Okay. 
So that's what I was trying to clear up, I mean, say there. And I wanted to clear that up so that if there's anyone out there that has had that happen, God does forgive. He forgives everything. All right? In the sense of that person, if you ask, that person that commits suicide, they don't have a chance to ask for forgiveness. Uh, I'm just curious. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But out of the people who are left, how many, how many of you guys would you say are just seeking? You're just on a spiritual journey at this point in your life and you're just seeking answers, trying to find your way versus, okay, I've already come to the decision. I, maybe I'm a Christian. I go to a church. So the, I hate to put you on the spot. I'm just curious if we have any seekers. Just seekers. So I guess I have to assume that everybody else here is a Christian. Yeah? Okay. Because then at least, you know, we know that, and sometimes the questions, we can go a little bit deeper or whatever it may be. Okay? All right. Because this is one of those kind of questions that comes in response to what Jesus said. He says, do you have to account for every word you have said, as the scriptures say? You know, in the sense of accounting for every word that you have said, in your sense, when I got there, I came to understand the bad words literally were no longer existing, all right? And the good words were really Jesus Christ speaking through me. So if I have to count for words, I had no words to account for. I'm just putting that out there. So I he looked at me, yeah. I always say this, he looked at me like I'd never sinned in my entire existence. So hopefully that just should give you the freedom that you need to know that you're really not going to... We were, going, we were talking about this the other night about judgment. Yeah. You know how the, the Bible in Corinthians talks about the judgment seat of, of Christ? And that judgment comes first to the household of God. And then there's the great white throne judgment in, in Revelation. Let me, let me clear that, even go a little bit farther. See, I came to understand that when we became born again, know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of us, we became a new creation. Okay, God has literally placed in us to act like we're supposed to be. You know, when he creates a tree, a tree acts like a tree. Am I correct, you guys? So if you're born again, know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you. He has given you the ability to act like you're supposed to be. Okay? And some people, i got to learn these things. There were a lot of things that I knew to do before I read my Bible, after I became a Christian. I knew to do them because the Holy Spirit was on the inside of me telling me, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. That's right. Am I right, you guys? Yeah. So I knew I could walk that word, and then I read later on, oh, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. But at the beginning, that was already inside of me to guide me how to walk this lifestyle that God has called me into. So a lot, I came to understand that you have the ability to walk this lifestyle. You just need to do it. That simple. I remember you saying something about excuses when you came back. Yeah, I, I, I came to the understanding when I came back, I lost all my excuses. If I choose not to do something God tells me to do, I can't say, I just, uh, you know, didn't know. I usually, most of the time, found out that God did tell me in a small way, I just ignored him. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, then I got myself in trouble, and I said, I wish I would have known. And God said, well, I told you way back there. Yeah. You know, right? That type of thing that goes on. And so I, I came to understand that I lost excuses. And that if I choose to not do something, I can't say I didn't know. I chose to not do it. Yeah. Now, the good thing about that, if I am that direct in saying I take the responsibility for it, then I can take the next step. Father, forgive me. <coughs> and what does he do? This is the comment he usually gives me. It's like, okay, you're forgiven, let's get to work. You know, that's just, I'm just letting you know, that's my, my thing. So yeah, but I came to understand everybody born again that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you, lose, you lost excuses. The main reason is because you do have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you, and he does prompt you many times not to do something. And ain't nobody else raising their hand because they don't. You know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There's time after time, you know, and it may be the smallest thing. Um, Bob, uh, are you in here, Bob Barker? No, he's not. No, he's not here. Well, I ain't gonna tell on him then. So. <laughs> well, in the, in the book, you talk about uh, that there's two armies. Yes. Is that a question on there, Jim? Yes. 
<laughs> and uh, so maybe you could just, because I'm interviewing the author of the book in heaven, and that is in the book. So I mean, because it goes to what you're talking about, that you, you delineated, said God says there's, there's two armies. And so yeah. when you became a Christian, you also were, I guess you, you weren't drafted, you were kind of drafted at the same time that you volunteered. It's kind yeah. of like both of those things. But you, you were drafted and volunteered into an army. Yes. And just a quick description of the two armies that are involved. Well, what he's talking about, when I, when I was in heaven, I, I saw Jesus strategizing. I saw Jesus putting things together. He was addressing a multitude of what I call beings. You would call them angel. Uh, some of them were redeemed. And they were in a half circle. And I came to understand as he was communicating to them, they were the spiritual army. They were the army that was literally going into the spiritual realm and doing battle. And then there was us, which was the other side of that, which has the authority on this planet. We're the physical army on this planet. And you join those two armies together to really get the results. A good example would be when Saul or Paul was um, stopped on the road to Damascus and Jesus Christ showed up. That was the spiritual realm. The physical realm was when Ananias was told to go talk to him about the Lord Jesus Christ. You guys hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And so a lot of times, that spiritual realm literally does exactly what the Father tells it to do or Jesus tells it to do. It's this physical realm here that has a hard time sometimes with obeying the orders. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know? And so th that's the two armies. They're really one army, but there's like two units. There's the our unit, and then there's the heavenly unit. Most of us don't realize that the Lord is asking you to do something. That means it's already been battled in the spiritual realm. He's already taken care of it in the spiritual realm. He's asking you to complete it now on this side. And how did the, uh, the heavenly beings and the redeemed relate to Jesus when they were strategizing? I love that story you said. Well, say. whenever he communicated to them, one of the reasons I wanted to stay is not only because everything was right, is because they know who he is. I know that's not proper English, but that's the way it is. He is. It is that he was, he will become, he is. He is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And so whenever he would communicate to any of the, of the beings there, they would look at him, literally, they would bow without taking their eyes off of him and back up. But they would leave immediately. And they would never turn their back on they him. They didn't turn their back on him. They would not turn their back on him, you know. The other thing I liked about it, there was no debates. No one going around saying, you know, that's Jesus. He ain't been down to that planet in a long time. He don't know how it is to deal with those humans. You know what I mean? I'm taking it to the high council of God, and we're going to talk about this, you know. No, they did exactly what he said, and they went. You know what they did it off of, you guys? Off of your prayers. Your prayers literally do move heaven. People say, well, that's something. I'm telling you, that's what Jesus said. He told us to pray that laborers would go into the fields. Your prayers, you guys. And, and most of us don't realize this, that when the Father is giving you something on this planet, it's really to enhance you to be the best witness for him on this planet to get people to be born again. You get a new house. You think it's just a house to make you comfort? No, it's a house that's given to you so that it puts you in the position to be the best witness you can on this planet for him. You get a new car, it's the same thing. I always tell people you want to prosper, just start doing what God wants you to do. He will give you all the materials you need to make sure that you're the best witness on this planet. I, I just put it out, but it has to be a pure heart. You know, a lot of times people want to prosper because they just want to have more comfort, you know. And, and you will have a comfort longer than you will have discomfort in your lifetime. You guys hear what I mean? Because you don't die. You will be with the Father of Jesus forever. And when you're in heaven, it is comfortable. <laughs> it's not discomfort there. So if you think about that, forever compared to your little time on this planet, forever you're going to be more in more comfort than discomfort. But if you have a mindset that I'm here to do what God wants me to do, so I need the resources to accomplish that, he will make sure you have the resources to accomplish what you're put here to do. What did they call Jesus in heaven? You're really going outside the box, aren't you? <laughs> I think it's really important for his, his kids and his followers to know that. In heaven, the name Jesus was not, was 
said. Someone said, then what was said? Savior. And if you know the, what the Greek name for Jesus is, it, it really is the, is the Hebrew name for um, Joshua. Or Yeshua. Joshua or Yeshua, Yeshua, which is Jehovah saves or Savior. So they didn't call him by the name that we call him in a sense on this planet, only because that name is really his purpose. He's the Savior. We say Jesus. That's what you're saying, Savior. When you say, help me, Jesus, you're saying, help me, Savior. What, is he, what does a Savior do? He helps you. Is that good news? Why do some who are sick on the earth, who have faith, to be healed, not healed? You know, that's, that's not a, a question I can answer. Um, why and why not? All I know that for me, when I first came back, uh, any Christian that was in a way that they looked like they were going to die and go to heaven, and they were asking me to pray for them, mm, it was almost like, why am I stopping them from going to heaven? You guys hear me? And then the Holy Spirit told me, he said, no, I'm the only one that knows the time. You always pray for healing. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what he told me. Hallelujah. So with a pure heart, I can lay hands on anyone to pray for healing because I know my father wants that. Why it happens and why it doesn't happen as quickly as some people think it should happen, I can't tell you. I do know this. The Bible says we that are Christians lay hands on the sick and they do recover. So I know this. They do get better. You guys hear what I just said? Yes. It may not, they, they may say, well, I just know that they get better. And most places I go, if Aaron would tell you, we do a lot of laying hands on people, and a lot of people, when I come back, tell me how they were healed. I never try to stay around to see if they were healed. I just do what Jesus tells me to do. Is there a difference between the spirit and the soul? Yeah, there's a difference between the spirit and the soul. The Bible even tells you that. The Bible really says you're a spirit, soul, and body person. The soul is really the consciousness. When I left this planet to go be with the Father and Jesus, I always say my soul and my spirit left. And i got to clarify that so that you understand. It was that side of my soul that had the pureness of the good things of God. The, the other side of the soul, which had the negative things, did not go. That's my consciousness. I did not take any negativeness with me. It stayed. You know. I guess this one should have came up earlier, but I guess God didn't want it. It's, so I don't even ask it. <laughs> I think we might have got through all of them. Hey, God. Anybody have any uh, new questions? Let's, 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 if we have time, Amy, do we have time? Let's take at least two questions from the audience. Okay, I'll let you pick the person since you live here. Okay. Yes, first. Can you give her the mic so we can get it all recorded? Okay. You don't see me. I mean, I was here the last time I heard you speak, and I would thank you for coming here again and You're speaking welcome. to all of us. You're a big inspiration for all of us. Um, I do have a problem, and I always ask people, I have to stop asking this question. <laughs> um, can you explain more about the Trinity? Because oh, when boy. you speak between about Jesus and God, uh, some people think that Jesus turns into God. Um, That's why I'm a little confused all the time. You know, I do do a training on that, and it takes a while to get there, to really train it, okay? Um, I am going to get myself out of it by telling you right now, in front of everybody, that um, I will talk to you later. <laughs> it is a hard question. I mean, just want to clarify a couple things. Sure. If you go into souls that are um, stuck here on earth, you know, like literally hauntings that, that you hear about or see about, uh, are those people just not wanting to go to the light because they're afraid that they did something wrong? Why are they still here? Why don't they leave? Oh, 
when I left, everybody was leaving. There was no one staying on this planet, okay? Um, so those souls that you're talking about, to me, are not people. They will be familiar spirits. Because when I left, everything was leaving. And I know it's hard for us to grasp that because, but I can see nothing staying on this planet after they left this body. They, 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 we all went before Jesus, all of us. I was looked at, and he saw himself on the inside of me, and I was in. Those that don't know Jesus Christ, it was like a magnitude, to the positive and the negative, they were repelled out. That's what you see. So I'm just answering you the best way I can, that those that you think are probably people on this planet, they're probably familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are really demonic, and they're, they're portraying to be something they're not. That's what they are. So yeah, they're here to deceive you. That's a good way of putting it. You know, I, and I say that, but again, I always tell people with their, their details. You need to probably, if, the, if anyone's had any of those experiences, they need to talk to a minister or a pastor in details. Do you understand what I mean? So that they can tease them out and then give them a better answer. Hi, Steve. Um, so I saw you last time when you came to this church, and I just really am fascinated with your story. Tonight you talked about um, how other people shared with you their separation experiences. Yes. And um, I just needed to know if anyone has ever shared with you a separation experience that didn't involve a uh, near-death experience or a bona fide death yes. experience. Thank you. Yes. The, the difference with it, though, is when I separated, um, I separated. So I didn't have any input from the flesh or my body on what I was experiencing when I was there. Okay? People that have out of body experiences that we call them, they're still connected to their, their body. Their body is still getting that information even though they may have that out of body experience and it's trying to define, understand, put it in every which way they can so it can understand. Okay, I didn't have that problem because I was separated from my body. When I came back to my body, my body was saying, yeah, it couldn't have been that way. But my spirit was saying, no, it was that way. There was a war that was going on inside because my body was literally saying, I don't believe it. I don't understand that. You could, that the first time someone asked me, um, was there instruments in heaven? And I said, well, what I saw was angels rising up and literally um, music was coming out of their mouths. Do you understand what I mean? And my, my flesh said, you are crazy. Seriously, as I'm answering, but I had to say what I experienced. And then I went and I found out that when Lucifer was created, that literally inside of him was, was put in drums and cymbals and, or flutes and drums was inside of him. So there it is in the Bible that God has done that before. And yet I, I didn't know that at that time. You say, well, you read your Bible, you should have known it. You know how you read it and you just go over things. And all of a sudden something stands out, that stands out because I had this experience. So my flesh was trying to tell me, there's no way, Dean. You're crazy now. You understand what I mean? Because it could not understand that. And yet that's what I experienced in the spiritual realm. The best thing that's helped me is to go back and, and, and literally filter it, what I call, through the Word of God. Okay? And by filtering it through the Word of God, I've been able to explain things even better. Does that answer your question? Yes. So, and, and I want to say, those people that have those out about experiences, I always say, it's not that they didn't experience what they experienced, it's now that they interpret it in a spiritual realm or in a, in a temporal realm. Remember how I used earlier, I said like, L-I-K-E? If you read your Bible in Revelation, the fourth chapter, when John is describing the throne of God, he uses L-I-K-E a whole lot. Because he's saying, I cannot give you that in the realm that you think you want. I can only give you this from this realm, but it's only like this. That's not saying that's what it is. That's the closest I can come to describing what it is. Does that answer your question? I, you know, there's, we spent a lot of time with Dean, and there's, there's a whole lot more depth, and I know that there's so many more questions that you might have, and 
probably will have. I strongly suggest uh, out there, he, he does have the, the table, and he has this, this, uh, this memory stick. And I, he, on this little memory stick, he's got like two, two or three DVDs, he's got a gazillion CD teachings, um, he's got his, this book here, the In Heaven book, and his wife's book. And I was just listening to today, just the first time, and he was, he was doing a teaching on uh, Ephesians 5, 8, where it says that, you know, you were the darkness, and now you have become the light, so walk as children of light. Maybe you're familiar with that. And just in that one little scripture, okay, in about 45 minutes, my mind got blown. And I've been a Christian for over 20 years. And you know, if we went back to the, uh, the, or the the origins of the way the world was created, and the beginnings where it says that God made light and the darkness and separated them, because he's talking about light, Lucifer, and how he was the morning star, and he's referred to as the shining one, bearer of light. I mean, I would I would strongly, strongly encourage you, go get that, go get that MP3, that and that little uh, memory stick. It, it'll be, the, it'll be the, one of the best investments that you ever make. Um, I know it seems to be a little pricey because maybe $65, but he has like over $500 worth of stuff on that, uh, on that little memory stick. Because honestly, I can vouch for him. He, he's not here trying to make money. Anybody who gives something that's $500 value for $65 is really not trying to make money. He's just trying to be able to, to, to get you to, like he says, to be the best witness that you can for the Lord Jesus. And, um, you know, the Bible says to present yourself as a living, living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when, when you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to teach you and expand on the things that, that God has dropped in his spirit to share with us, um, you will just grow, not in your head, because knowledge puffs up. You'll grow in your spirit. Because honestly, it's really all about how do we learn how for our spirit man to be so much stronger than our natural man. That's the biggest struggle we have, isn't it? I mean, we're in this battle between our natural mind and our natural man, okay, warring against our spiritual man for, to, for us to be all it is that God has said we already are and what he wants us to do. And that's our biggest struggle. And so what does he do? He says, you know, you need to learn what God has already made you to be, who you really already are. And we find that in the scripture, and when your mind gets renewed, it builds your spirit man up, and then you become the person who will be drawn into those mighty acts for God. And because you are more than a conqueror. And you will go and you will destroy the works of the devil. Yes. Just like Jesus says. Listen, don't be so excited the fact that you know you, you saw. You know, you went there and you raised the dead and you, you know, you cast out demons. You know, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Because that's where we are, right? We're, we're, that's our citizenship. We are heavenly spiritual beings. That's what's so awesome about being a demon. Because he really knows what that means now. And he can help us to understand the scriptures now from a heavenly perspective. That's why when I said to you, this book, what impressed me the most about it, was it's like an apologetics book. This book is just filled with one scripture after the other, defining what it was that he experienced. And so, I mean, that is our standard. That's how we know the truth. Not just because he says it, and he's a nice guy, and he looks like, okay, we can believe him, but it's because what he's telling us can be verified in the scriptures. And so the more depth of spiritual understanding we can get in the scriptures, the more our spirit man can become stronger. And then we can put our flesh down. It says, reckon your, your flesh dead. Right? That's the key. How do you do that? You do that by understanding that you are spiritual beings. That God says, lift up your eyes and see into eternity. You are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. What does that mean? But that's the truth. That's the thing that sets us free. That's the thing that gives us the victory. And unfortunately, we have all this stuff that we're taught that basically has kept us down from really understanding who we really are, how good and awesome God really is, and the plans that he has for us, which are exceedingly abundantly above anything you can ask, which is pray, or think, which is your imagination. 
Imagine God has more for you than you can imagine or even pray for. He doesn't just promise you that because he doesn't want you to realize it, right? So what does he do? He sends people like Dean. He drops information, not for his source, for his sake, but for our sake. So I would just really say it, it, it would be the greatest $65 you'll ever spend. I'm sure if you bought a nice Bible, it would probably cost $65. But to understand it better, it's probably worth the $65 that you spent for the Bible. Just spend another $65 and you get the most out of it. So I just really, that's, that's not even a commercial for him. It's just really, I, I know him and I know his heart. I, I've been exposed to it. I just know just, just talking with him how it is has really, really deepened my understanding of what it means to be a spiritual person. And, um, you know, I'm really, um, I can only express that you really should take advantage of it while you can because you'll be gone and, you know, you'll get busy and you'll move on to the next day. And, you miss the opportunity. Please don't miss the opportunity. We want to see you grow and be all that you can be with Jesus. Okay? So actually, we are, we are finished for the night. If anybody would like to, we have some.